So Admiral, General, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored and thrilled to open this webinar focusing on climate change impact on maritime spaces in the Bay of Bengal. Um, I'm Julia Tassi. I'm the head of the climate and security program here at the French Institute for International and Strategic Affairs. And I will be the host of today's conference. Um, so this webinar is focusing on climate change impact on marine biodiversity and maritime security in the Bay of Bengal. And it's co-organized by the French Development Agency and the Directorate General for International Relations and Strategy of the French Ministry for Armed Forces. It will be launching a common research program aiming at gathering the scientific community and officials from the Bay of Bengal and Europe around sustainable and safe management and use of maritime spaces and maritime resources in the Bay of Bengal. The objective of this seminar is therefore to provide an arena for dialogue in the area. We hope we'll be able to enable part participants to identify research topics that will be deepened and regularly discussed during institutional and sectoral meetings, both in France and within geographies in the Bay of Bengal. We also hope this webinar could be a first draft for cooperation pathways and the implementation of common tools between French and regional stakeholders. To come back on practical aspects, so you will find at the bottom of your screen, a Q&A and discussion panel. Please feel free to send a comment or a question anytime. For each session, we'll have around an hour of presentations and then we'll open the discussion with the audience and you're of course welcome to ask panelists any questions. You can also raise your hands, which will enable you when, um, when the Q&A session will start to uh, ask your question orally. So today conference will be opened by the General Colcombe. General Colcombe is the head of the International Security Affairs Office in the Directorate General for International Relations and Strategy of the French Ministry for Armed Forces. General, I, respect, I respectfully give you the floor. Thank you. Can you uh, hear me? Yes, very well. Yeah, okay, perfect. So good morning, good morning, good afternoon to you all, our distinguished uh, speakers, my colleagues from the French uh, Agency for Development and the entire Irish team. And let me first congratulate you for the excellent organization of the seminar, which I find uh, very timely and uh, it's a very clever initiative. And it's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to say a few words at the beginning of this event, which I find uh, very relevant and in at least two regards. And firstly, the seminar provides a forum for, for discussion, as you said, uh, between officials, scholars, and practitioners, which will, with no doubt, improve our capacity to contribute to security and uh, development in the Indian Ocean in cooperation with our regional partners. Uh, our president, President uh, Emmanuel Macron, presented the French strategy in the Indo-Pacific while speaking in, uh, at, at the Garden Island base in Sydney in 2018. And this rule of government approach aims to maintain an Indo-Pacific region that is free and open according to the principles of multilateralism and international law. And part of the strategy consists in ensuring that the sea lanes of communication in the Indian Ocean remain safe and free from any kind of coercion. Our sovereign and forward posted forces are naturally uh, key contributors to regional security through the implementation of their sovereign missions in our territorial waters and through their cooperation with our regional partners. Let me just cite, for example, our partnership with India, which is ever growing, especially in the maritime domain. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced that by the end of the seminar, we will have uncovered even more ways to cooperate in favor of regional security. And France is also an important 
contributed to regional multilateralism. And the seminar is a very strong contribution as France as leader of the marine resource pillar in the Indo-Pacific Indian, Indian Ocean Initiatives. As you know, we, we just took over this uh, IONS Indian Ocean Naval Symposium Presidency. And we're looking forward to working hand in hand with other neighboring navies of the Indian Ocean on vital topics such as uh, HADR, maritime security, and maritime information sharing. We are also enthusiastic about bringing the intention, the, the attention of our partners on envi environmental, mental, and climate security. And I will come back to this later. Secondly, the seminar is the first event of what will become, I hope, a long-term partnership between the Ministry of the Armed Forces in France and the French Agency for Development in the, in the Indo-Pacific. This 3D approach guides the international actions of France in context of crisis and fragility, meaning that development, diplomacy and defense must work in close symbiosis. And the seminar demonstrates the relevance of applying this approach to other contexts, especially in the vast and complex area of the Indo-Pacific. Let me say now just a few words about the, on the topic of the seminar. Why should we care about the climate change impact on biodiversity and maritime security? If you allow me, I will focus on maritime security and will leave my AFD colleague to talk for, bio, for the biodiversity part. Also both are closely intertwined. France has been including climate change into its strategic thinking since 2015. Climate change is now widely recognized as the threat multiplier because it has the potential to exacerbate many of the challenges and vulnerabilities we already confront today, from infectious disease to armed insurgencies and to produce new risks and challenges in the future. Destructions and devastation from hurricanes can sow the seeds for instability. Droughts and crop failures can leave millions of people without any lifeline and, tr and trigger waves of mass migrations. For some states, and, and, and especially some islands, climate change is simply a question of life or death. In the maritime domain specifically, the IPCC acknowledged the existence of links between the effects of climate change on coastal communities and maritime crime. Ocean, ocean warming causes the migrations of fish stocks, which incite local and industrial fishing fleets to turn to illegal fishing far away from the coast. EW fishing, in turn, fuels tensions with neighboring countries. Local governments have sometimes taken drastic actions to regulate fishing activities to prevent further degradation of marine, of marine resources. And this has left some with no earning at all. The Coast Guards and sometimes navies are on the front line facing maritime insecurity. And the better we will understand the trends provoked by climate change, and the readier we will be able to respond to such issues. Thank you for this uh, seminar again, and I wish you a very good and very fruitful uh, discussions. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. So the rest of the, of the webinar will be divided into two sessions. The first one, will tackle sustainable management of fish stock in the Bay of Bengal. What practices for a better preservation of ecosystem, especially with regards to the impact of climate change. And the second one will focus on maritime security and will start at 11 a.m. French time. So to start with the first session, the idea is to 
really understand how climate change could impact marine biodiversity and especially fish stock in the Bay of Bengal, how such impacts will then affect coastal populations, especially coastal fishing populations and coastal fishermen, how cooperation, collaboration could help tackle this issue. And this session will also be at the basis of the second session, considering climate change impacts on maritime security through the scope, among other, of this fish stock and IUU fishing problems. So our first session, we'll, we have the opportunity to have very distinguished panelists with us. We have Dr. Francis Marsac, who is an oceanographer and fishery scientist at the French Institute for Research for Sustainable Development, with a leading expertise in ecology and assessment of tuna fisheries. He works closely with the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission and has chaired the scientific committee for several years. His research includes the impact of climate variability and change on marine resources. We also have the Professor Abdul Wahab, the founder of the Fisheries Management Department at the Bangladesh University and the Dean of this Faculty for Fishery. He has been the principal investigator for USAID Feed for the Future Aqua Fish Innovation Lab in the Bangladesh section and promoted small scale aquaculture technologies throughout the region. Dr. Abdul Wahab has joined Worldfish in its USAID funded Enhanced Coastal Fisheries in Bangladesh program as a team leader to promote conservation of Hilsa fisheries and coastal biodiversity, aiming at improving livelihoods for the fishing communities and support aquatic food production system throughout the region. Dr. Vivekanandan is joining us from Chennai, India. His work in various capacities, including head of division and principal scientist in Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute until 2012. And he's now an expert consultant in the same institution. He has over 40 years of continuous experience in marine fisheries research and development. He holds a PhD from Madura University and has pioneered the research on marine fish production marine fish population dynamics, stock assessments, climate change, and marine ecosystem modeling. He has led a major research project on climate change and marine fisheries for seven years. And finally, Dr. Gilles Kleitz from the AFD will also join us. He's the director for the Ecological Transition and Natural Resources Department. His role is then to ensure the preservation of ecosystem is taken into account in all AFD fields of activity, including water, transport, energy, health, and employment. He's trained as an agriculture, agricultural engineer, and he holds a PhD in political science. He's been working on the link between conservation and sustainable development for over 30 years, including 10 years working at the French Environmental Ministry. So this first session will now start. I will leave the floor to Dr. Francis Marsac to present the broad, in, the broad image of climate change impacts on marine biodiversity and fish stock in the Bay of Bengal. Dr. Marsac, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Julia. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, so, um, yeah, as uh, Julia said, so I'm trying to share my screen. So, yeah, my uh, presentation will be, will focus more on the uh, an impact on the, of climate change on marine fisheries. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll have a kind of a focus on the, on the, on the Bay of Bengal. But uh, definitely this comes, this is integrated in the whole climatology of the Indian Ocean, as you can imagine. Uh, just uh, to make sure, do you hear me well and do you see my screen? Yes, both. Okay, let's go on. So, um, 
I, I've got more or less two parts. Yeah, you have the, the outlook on fisheries, and we'll go more uh, in detail in the in the in the uh, in the climate uh, aspect. So um, first of all, uh, we have to consider what we what we mean by the Bay of Bengal, especially in my presentation. So these all the countries that you see uh, from Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, and part of uh, Indonesia. And this slide gives you especially on the left side, gives you a, an idea of how the, 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 the share, uh, the fisheries across all these countries. As you can see, we have uh, uh, one heavyweight, I would say, which is uh, Indonesia, uh, but also India is a big player in the region and followed by uh, Myanmar. Uh, the other countries are between five to 10%. And um, as you can see on the left, um, on the right, sorry. Uh, so this makes up a production of about 6.5 million tons yearly. Um, and this is about 10% of the world fisheries production. Uh, you, the graph shows you that uh, the trend uh, became significant from the, the mid 80s. And uh, we still have uh, an overall increase of the, of the total catch in the, in the Bay of Bengal. I mean, for the, the countries which are listed down there. Obviously, Indonesia, I mean, it's the national statistics, so it includes other parts, I mean, more the East Indian Ocean, uh, not, the, the, not the Pacific, but at least for the south from the Bay of Bengal. And um, so Indonesia is still increasing its share, which is also the case of India. The rest of the countries are more or less uh, stable for the past uh, five, 10 years. And fish makes up to 87% of the, of the catch. Now, we also have to consider uh, another aspect of, uh, uh, for the livelihoods and the, uh, the protein uh, input that's the, based on the aquaculture. So the aquaculture uh, represents about 1.3 million tons in the region. And on the left panel, you can see that most of the aquaculture is uh, inland or I mean uh, continental aquaculture in brackish waters. Um, uh, Otherwise, the marine uh, area is only, uh, the marine share is quite low, 40,000 for the, the marine aquaculture and 1.3 uh, for, uh, for the continental. And it's good also to compare the its production by aquaculture to, to the capture fisheries. Uh, you see that we have had uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the increase in the aquaculture production is, is quite recent in the region after the 2000s where it was, of course, much earlier for the capture fisheries. And uh, we have uh, approximately uh, five times more uh, capture fisheries compared to aquaculture uh, production. And um, actually, we have, again, three levels of uh, aquaculture producers in the region. So the large number one is India, with uh, above 700,000 tons. We have intermediate country, Bangladesh, with about 200,000. And uh, the rest uh, are below 70,000. So I'm, a, I'm an expert in tuna fisheries, so I could not, I could not avoid talking about a, a bit of the, of the tuna fisheries. So uh, just to show you, uh, so the Bengal Bell Gold in those maps is represented in the red square. These are maps from the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. And uh, it shows that uh, the, uh, the, the, the Bay of Belgol is not and has never been a, a major uh, tuna fishing area, at least for the offshore tuna. Um, so you see the, the, the first, uh, the upper, upper left is the year 90s, then down we have the year 2000s, and then 2010s, and the, the, the latest uh, you know, robust inform information is 2018. You see that actually we had a, a, a decline in this fishing effort. So this is maps for the long line uh, fleet. Uh, so we had a decline in this fishing effort. And now, I mean, although it is less, uh, the trend is towards uh, fresh tuna long line, which is more valuable because it can supply the sashimi market. So this is something important to note that you can uh, uh, reduce your fishing effort, but increase the value of the catch. And um, so it gives uh, another idea of, about the gears which are uh, responsible for those catch. So for the three main tropical species, the big eye tuna, which is a deep dwelling tuna. So you don't find much in the middle of the Bay of Bengal, 
because uh, of the low oxygen. We'll, we'll see that later. So it's mostly a coastal long line and mix of coastal gears for big eye. Uh, Skidjack uh, gill net is important, more specifically in the in the southwest of the Bay of Bengal, and the coastal long line as well for yellowfin. As you can see on the east side of the Bay of Bengal, we don't find so much uh, these uh, major tuners. And the graph down there is uh, just to give the trend since the 80s. So uh, that's for the whole tuner catches. It includes the major tuners, but also the neritic, the coastal tuners, and the billfish. And you see uh, the, the, the weight of uh, Indonesia because the, the, the orange curve uh, combines all seven countries. So it's about 360 thousand tons of tuna in the in the recent years and uh, if you remove uh, Indonesia we are around 134 so Indonesia again the big player in for, for, for this uh, for tuna catch and um, but we have to note that this tuna production has been declining since the 2005 so there was this uh, Bay of Bengal uh, LME project, and they uh, ended up with uh, identifying the three main areas of concern in the region. So uh, I'm not going to detail, of course, in that because I think the other presenters will, will, will go through that. But definitely, we have to, to, to keep in mind the heavy degradation of critical habitats, especially mangroves, reefs. And of course, we know that is going to, to, to alter the, um, the, um, the, 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 the uh, I mean, the turnover of the population because a lot of nurseries are located in these areas. Um, and the cause definitely uh, it's because we need to supply foods for uh, coastal poor. There is an increase in to tourism along the coast and this uh, leads to higher demand. You have the pollution and water quality. So of course, uh, pollution, which is due to uh, urbanization and uh, increasing coastal population density. And then of course, we have the overexploitation of living marine resources. So there are less resources, the species composition is changing with more small fish. And of course, this has an effect on the whole food web and the diversity. So now we can uh, shift to the, to the ocean climate. So I'm going to make, first of all, the, the kind of main features that we have to know on the Bay of Bengal. It's a, it's a quite a unique region in terms of uh, oceanography. So um, left panel shows the, the sea surface temperature. That's a place where we have the most, uh, the highest uh, sea surface temperature in the Indian Ocean. Uh, and also we have the dominant winds from the southwest uh, monsoon. So all this, uh, of course, this promotes, you know, convection and, and, and monsoon uh, rainfall. So, and the other very important uh, feature is the salinity, which is in the middle panel. You see this blue area in the Bay of Bengal uh, reflects very low salinity. And of course, the, the, the reason is because of this large um, uh, uh, rivers, you know, uh, the Ganji, the Brahmaputra, all this uh, region which is a, a lot of river, uh, freshwater input from, from river runoff. And also as shown on the, on the, on the, the lines, that's a heavy precipitation. You have more precipitation uh, than evaporation. So all this tends to have a very, uh, very uh, low salinity surface. And actually the combination of warm temperature and low salinity makes that you have a very uh, low density layer. And this low density layer, which is at the surface, doesn't mix with what is behind because we have a particular barrier layer. And uh, the consequence of that is that upper right, we have a very low uh, dissolved oxygen level at depths. We, have, we can even reach sometimes anoxic levels. So uh, below 0 0.2 or 3 uh, um, millimeter per liter, so definitely, it's a, it's a, it's a very it's it's a very unique. Also with the with the radiancy uh, for this uh, particular uh, stressor, and also so this is due to this intense stratification. You know, very light waters on the surface, and the lack of uh, vertical uh, stratification, the lack of mixing, 
and of course the lack of ventilation, the, the, the oxygen cannot penetrate into the deeper layers. And also the other consequence is that we have a, a rather moderate primary productivity. All the productivity is confined at the, at the, at the surface. Um, and uh, this stratification in, in oxygen uh, and the productivity makes that uh, the zooplankton in the Bay of Bengal is located in a very thin mixed layer. Uh, at the surface. Um, actually, uh, 70, it's known that 70 to 80% of the zooplankton biomass is uh, within the very first uh, tens of meters in the Bay of Bengal. So this is a very specific situation and it has implications with respect to climate trends. So when we speak to climate trends, we also have to consider the interannual climate variability. And this is summarized in this sketch. So we have this uh, dipole mode. Uh, we have a dipole in the Indian Ocean, it can be two phases, positive phase, with uh, lower than normal temperature on the east and higher than normal on the west. And of course, the negative phase is the opposite. And we can see uh, over time, you know, this graph since the 50s shows that we go from a positive in orange to negative phase and with the acceleration of the process during the, the recent years. This uh, IOI, this DMI, the dipole moon index, actually plays in conjunction with the El Nino, but not, on, not always. Sometimes we have a kind of variability in the Indian Ocean, which is very specific to the Indian Ocean and without any strong El Ninos. But when both uh, happen at the same time, it's quite a, it's, it's quite a lot of, uh, in terms of impacts. And so the climate trend, which is uh, obviously by, by uh, models, uh, you see I've represented three major stressors, the sea surface temperature, the dissolved oxygen and the net primary production. You see, so this gives the status where we'll be at the end of the 21st century compared to where we are now. And this is only, uh, I took the highest uh, uh, Green, uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission scenario, which is the, the worst, but at least it's good to know because the, 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 tra the trajectory for the moment is not so good. So you see that uh, on the east uh, uh, in the Bay of Bengal with sea surface temperature, you don't see much increase, but it is because we are already high temperature. So relative, the, the, the increase will not be that important, but still it will be much above 2.5 degrees. In terms of the dissolved oxygen, uh, a part uh, of the of the region will uh, benefits from some more ventilation, but the, the, the east part will be less. But again, uh, another indication is all the the, the dots that you see uh, gives the area where we have a good confidence between all models because it's not only one model; it's an ensemble of models. But in the in the Bay of Bengal region, we have very uh, low accuracy of this uh, prediction. And you see again for the net primary productivity, the red is a, a decline is less primary productivity and red is slightly more. But uh, I mean, most of the area definitely will be affected with, uh, with less primary productivity. So when we combine all this, uh, we show that uh, the uh, Bay of Bengal definitely the major stressor, the major problem will be uh, decline in, uh, in the oxygen. And we might, we might go to uh, anoxic conditions uh, below 100 meters. And this actually, uh, with the expansion of these uh, dead zones, these anoxic zones, it can go, it can reach goes upper to the surface. And we also have these extreme events, which are again modulated by the, by the Indo-Pacific climate variability. So the, the El Nino and the DMI. So this basically the, the marine heat waves which are projected to, to, to increase in, in, in frequency and, uh, and uh, duration. Um, and especially, particularly in the Northern Indian Ocean, uh, you see uh, the three, uh, four areas where you have this uh, marine heat waves to increase. So the Bay of Bengal definitely is one of these. And this probably will be associated to coral bleaching. And the other um, extreme events, of course, in the region are the cyclones. Um, we expect to, I show here the different uh, areas for cyclogenesis. So you see Bay of Bengal is one of these, uh, of these areas uh, with a very specific uh, temporal distribution. 
we have cyclones, you know, in the in spring and, and fall. Um, so what is actually remarkable, and it's 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 not a good news, but it's only five to six percent of tropical cyclones globally, but uh, almost 90 percent of the fatalities uh, come from the cyclone. So it's a it's a we have a lot of deadly cyclones hitting the Bay of Bengal. So we think the, the good news in a way, we think that uh, if we have increasing uh, any new condition and positive uh, dipole, it would reduce the tropical cyclone activity. So it would be slightly better because we, we think we are going towards more uh, El Ninos. Uh, but since then, during the past 20 years, we haven't seen any significant trend uh, in, the, in the Bay of Bengal in terms of tropical cyclone. So this is kind of a sketch depending on the forcing you have. So you see on the upper right, the El Nino and positive, you definitely, this east part of the Indian Ocean would see less tropical cyclones developing. And even considering other uh, aspects, uh, it's, it's, it looks that there will be less. Uh, sea level rise, sea level rise definitely has a strong uh, impact on the, on the local population, local fisheries as well. Um, the, um, the, the, it, in the North Indian Ocean, we had uh, more than three millimeter per year, which is actually, it's, a project, it's ri rising at a faster pace in the future. And it's one of the, the highest pace that we can see uh, compared to other parts of the Indian Ocean where you have a lower um, uh, sea level rise, not so much affected. Bay of Bengal, you see these red areas. We may have uh, 15, uh, 10 to 15 centimeter uh, per century. So the marine resources are obviously vulnerable to, to that. Uh, we have um, oxygen declines. That's no good for, for tuners, for the, for the large pelagic fish. Uh, there is decreased potential catch of hillside. I think we'll have more uh, information on that uh, later in this conference. Uh, we have changes in distribution. Uh, on the right, I put the, 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 for the tuners, what is expected to change. Uh, in terms of unsuitable habitats for tropical tuna. So you see, depending on the scenario you're using, the Gulf, uh, the, the Bay of Bengal, will see a very detrimental conditions for the survival of uh, tuners. And the red areas correspond to 2080, but even from 2070, we can see some uh, detrimental effects. You will have a change in the behavior and the phenology of the, of the fish, their movements, a reduction in the size of the fish, and obviously because of the pH, which is uh, increasing at a, at a very fast pace, uh, which is lowering. I mean, the, 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 the acidity is, is increasing. Um, so definitely the shellfish species will be most affected. So I will finish with this uh, slide on the kind of responses and adaptation. So um, definitely, first of all, we need to improve the national climate change policies and, uh, and better coordinate these policies. Uh, across the region. Um, you have some regional organizations that can direct efforts to document and understand and possibly apply proven successful adaptation mechanisms. And it also uh, contributes to disseminate information and awareness, better awareness of vulnerabilities. Now also we have to, 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 to base on the traditional management systems because they, they may support livelihoods. Uh, definitely any adaptation plan must be in line with communities' needs, uh, interests. So this is, first of all, to empower uh, fisheries communities and, and also to maybe switching between farming and fishing uh, activities, depending on the season. So, I mean, one of the, the, one of the outcome is, uh, is diversification of activities. Of course, this goes along training, uh, and there are other options uh, which are also um, investigated. That's the cultivation of uh, aquatic uh, algae that can serve, you know, food, pharmaceutical purpose, and, and, and production of biodiesel. So this is something that comes into the, what we call the blue economy. So all these uh, livelihoods, this uh, contribution with communities can be done through fish farmers, development agencies, which are in India, Myanmar, and other countries. We also have to implement an ecosystem-based approach to fisheries. This is in line with the FAO code of conduct for responsible fisheries. 
So it allows to restore fish recruitment, to restore the habitats, and uh, to improve a kind of co-management. Definitely, this is some of the most powerful tools are the what we call the marine protected areas. And as an example, Bangladesh has established, I think, more than 500 fish sanctuaries and, and marine reserve as well. So we also, it includes as well, what we call ecological restoration and special planning, which is a, a policy to, to allocate special and temporal uh, distribution of, of human activities to achieve uh, ecological, economic, and, and social objectives. Then we also need to implement fishery specific adaptive management plans because Number one, shore stocks are shared between the, the EZ, between the countries. And of course, fishing overlaps national jurisdiction. Uh, so this has to go together, uh, a complement of the ecosystem base that some, tip, some specific fisheries have to be managed on a very specific way. Uh, there is also some um, needs to, to, to put, uh, to increase the, um, the, the stability, economic stability of fishes with a number of instruments, you know, uh, low access to insurance, uh, welfare, credits, minimum wages, so to, to, to ensure that they, they can continue profit and, and be active part of the, of the uh, labor force in the countries. Um, there needs to change as well. Um, we need change in industry to, to, to increase the catch values. Something that I was mentioning earlier, you can catch less, but uh, more targeted product, and uh, we a better transform product, uh, you know, on shore. Um, so this opens the gate to international markets. Uh, in Bangladesh, for instance, I heard that there is export of very high quality shrimps because they have been introducing sanitary hazard control traceability. That's what is required when you want to export to Japan, to EU, to the United States. And also a possibility to, to, to boost the local industry by putting some uh, bans on importers. Um, and then uh, definitely we need to foster and to promote any initiative of international research and collaboration programs. Uh, as you know, the, 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 the Bay of Bengal is, is very vulnerable to, to tropical cyclones. And we definitely we need to improve the monitoring of those cyclones and uh, and be able to 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 detect the early warning systems that's that's underway uh okay. salinity as well yeah i'm finishing mm -hmm. <laughs> salinity as well is uh, something that needs to be to be monitored because it's it has an effect on the, an impact on the cyclogenesis so we have different uh, projects uh, being done in the in the region that can be can can sustain this international research. And now that's the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I will now leave the floor uh, to Dr. Abdul Wahab. If you're still with us, and. Uh, you have 15 minutes to present. If you would like to share your screen. Perfect. Dr. Abdulwahab, I will ask you to, to uh, remain in the 15 minutes, please, so that we'll have the time for a question and answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir. Julia Tessa. My presentation is a story of revival of hill shard fishery in this region. And we tried under a USAID funded ecofish project. We balanced the marine biodiversity conservation and livelihoods of the fishers in the Bay of Bengal region. Thank you, audience. This is Bangladesh maritime areas, Bangladesh's sovereign maritime water, the Bay of Bengal shaped like a trough that makes it more hospitable to storm. Since 1584, 36 deadliest tropical cyclones in the world history hit Bangladesh and South Asia. Uh, this is the 
death zones have been shown over here, but scientists have found that the submarine canyons induce upwelling that make them major hotspots of biological productivity and increased fish gases. It is an important ecological refuge for marine wildlife like dolphins, sharks, and various animals. Marine living resources at a glance, I'll not read all. Our total marine water area, 118,000 square kilometer, about 80% of Bangladesh. And um, we have 710 kilometer of coastline. Uh, two important points I will mention that fin fish species have been recorded in the past 475, but recent survey shows that it is 232. So there is either we need further study or maybe some species gone. Shark rates, these also found 50 in the past, now it is 35. Our contribution in this large water body is not very much. Mostly 60,000 artisanal fishers capture about over 5.5 uh, of um, cases and industrial with a 255 large vessel only capture over 100,000 fish. So in country's context, Bangladesh, we produce about 4.38 million metric ton, of which only 15% comes from marine water. So there is potential for further augmentation, conservation, and improvement. So the threatened marine species needs conservation. This is the IUCN list have shown that both bony fishes, cartilaginous fishes, turtles, mammals, even migratory birds like spoonbill sandpepper, green shank, great knot, they are of critically endangered level. So time is to protect them. USA come forward with a fund of $13 million as Ecofish One in 2014, enhanced coastal fisheries in Bangladesh with an objective of improved resilience of the Meghna River as ecosystem, uh, communities, and communities reliant on fisheries. There are four IRs, and it has science, co-management, so psychological aspect, and policy dimensions. Why Hilsha? Because 0.5 million Bangladeshi fishers go to the sea, go to the coastal rivers to cast Hilsha. When Hilsha was not there, they are casting everything from juvenile to all the biodiversity was damaged. That's why if we can improve Hilsha, we can improve the fisheries back again. So Hilsha shared is a geographical indication product of Bangladesh. It's a national fish. It is Bengali's national fish. It is equally important in India, Myanmar. 12% of fish now comes from uh, Bangladesh. 12% uh, of entire fish uh, is the Hilsha, uh, and uh, it contributed 60 to 65% of global Hilsha gas. The rest was mostly India and Myanmar. It contributes 1% to the GDP, very rich in micronutrient and omega 3. 0.5 million fishers involved directly, another 2.5 million involved in value chain. So Hilsha is important. So in our program, this is the theater of operation, Bangladesh's lower part, and the mightiest river flowing through Bangladesh, originating in Himalayas, Tibet, as well as in China, Ganges, um, um, Brahmaputra, and Meghna, all confluence together in the name of uh, uh, Meghna and flowing to the, close to the Bay of Bengal. So we have selected 400 kilometers of important section as sanctuary, six sanctuaries, and we have got a management measures. And to tell you something about Hilsha, Hilsha is an anadromous fish. It lives in the ocean, adulthood at sea, then migrate during breeding season, and then lays eggs. And that eggs 
come to the juveniles for eight months cycle, then come to brackish water back again and goes back to spend adulthood. So the fish is important in rivers, in estuary, as well as in ocean. We have, as a plan, we have taken care of the ecosystem health. So we have, we have tried to reduce the plastic pollutants from the rivers coming to the ocean and from the vessels as well as try to remove the abundant fishing gears, which are called ghost gears. We try to clean the CBCs. Currently program is going on. We are deploying blue guards to take care of blue ocean. Our slogan is clean bees, blue ocean, healthy planet. You see the most beautiful parts of Bangladesh, Cox's Bazaar to take up because of the refugees influx. This is the situation and these are going to affect the biodiversity. We have done this science-based work. We started with stock assessment of fish in river and ocean, and the current production was very low, and we proved that we can produce over 500,000 tons of fish from Bangladesh. We need better management. We later on, again, studied in 2019. I'll tell you the result in a moment. We have done fish and megafauna biodiversity conservation through DNA barcoding. We tried to safeguard the megafauna and we have been continuously monitoring using the boat skipper citizen scientists who are equipped with mobile apps and GPS. We introduced the adaptive co-management first ever in the region, if not in the region, but in the Bangladesh. We co coordinated, collaborated, and we brought all these stakeholders on board. And we, uh, we set up union level co-management committee, Upozela sub-district and district level. We trained 500 skippers and we'll do 5,000 five years. 400 community fish guard we employed to save the Hilsha sanctuaries along the 420 kilometer major river sanctuary. We have taken action of combating the illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. Are you fishing? We are training up the boat skipper, Mazi, head Mazi, the main person in the boat for responsible fishing and biodiversity conservation, they had no idea before. We have piloted both licensing of heroes. Bangladeshi bought about 60,000 artisanal boats. These are the fish guards. We have buying the fishing community through supporting them livelihood through their social well-being. We provided livelihood supports. We provided the net, net making substances the chicken, uh, ducks, as their wishes, as well as goats. One lady got one goat, now she's planning to buy cows. It continues, and 5,000 women trained for alternative income generating activities, all women brought under business literacy school to highlight the early marriage impact, as well as gender-based violence. And this is the empowerment. And you see, this is now the development. And we provided the policy support to Bangladesh government during this period. What are those policy support? Oh, government, please take care of 22 days brood hill shaban in October, very important day. That is, it breeds throughout the time, but that's the optimum time. And we have again refixed the um, stock assessment, MSY, uh, about 600,000 metric ton. We increased the net size from 4.5 centimeter to 6.5. We introduced citizen scientists so that they can monitor the cases. We found that all the hills are not similar. Some hills come to Padma, some hills in Meghna, some hills breed even along the coast. So there are three races need separate management. We also promote, proposed a huge, large MPA at the mouth of three rivers. 
to cover the breeding ground of Helsha. So beside that, we provided conservation measures by giving 65 days marine fishing ban, 20th May to 23rd May, ecosystem resilience enhanced through this spawning success, juvenile revival, as well as recruitment increases. Fisheries biodiversity increased, megafauna cash reduced, higher cash, higher income, but sufferings of 0.5 million fishers household during ban period increased. Question is that who pays, who gains? These are the leaflet posters we give to the people. So it is the 148 days they don't fish. What to, how to support them? Is it sufficient? That's the question. Government only provide them 40 kg rice per month. That is not sufficient. Through all these efforts and all the management measures, we made a revolution in the Hilsha production, which came down up to that level in 2002, only less than 200 metric tons. There was a national growth of 5,000 percent, but Ecofish made this revolutionary progress. And as per their predicted MSI, we have produced 500,000. 533,000, that is the ecofish contribution. Then, while we were discussing with Julia the other day, it was necessary to compare it with the current marine cases. You see the 45% of Hilsha now constitute the marine cases and raised is the other fishes, Bombay duck, shrimp, sharding, jew, trumpet, sea catfish, etc. Importantly, a miscellaneous small fishes is going big, uh, bigger cast, which has a potential. It was uh, trash fish before, but now we can use as nutrition because this is pelagic small fish, very rich in micronutrient. We can provide alternate feeding program with the people of lactating mother and children too. And as some indication, Indian salmon, back spotted Crocker, a Chinese pomfret, these are the species vulnerable. Now USAID is very happy. They said, go ahead for another five years. And this is a plan for Ecofish too. This is five years program. I believe that Iris and other all uh, development agencies can continue for 20 years, take care of megafauna conservation, introduce EFM, go for seaweed and mussel farming, climate resilient aquatic farming. Let's go for adaptive co-management. We need to take care of ecosystem health. Coastal biodiversity is a priority. MP delineation, we have done one, we are going to do another. And eventually, fishers' well-being must be taken care of. So under this ecofish program, we have taken a huge biological assessment program that I'm not going to tell you, only access to innovations and gateway to blue economy. Women led improved safe dried fish production is started. We have been training thousand women and producing. 5,000 is started, 5,000 will start during this winter season and marketing link is developed. We piloted marine farming of edible seaweeds and green mussel. We don't have the blue mussel like the uh, New Zealand, but we have got a beautiful green mussel. We can do that and we have started. We have started youth engaged crab farming and fattening. We have started mushroom farming by the women. Women are very happy, they are learning. That's indication of blue economy. What is our expectation? Biodiversity of fish, larvae and megafauna protected after this end of this project. Fishers, keepers become aware of responsible fishing. MP delineated, additional 200,000 marine fish and hillsha will be harvested. Marine farming generated employment and reduced fishing pressure. Women laid and hygienic dried fish produced and consumed by the vulnerable people, including the refugees. We are committed to do the economic empowerment for the women so that GBV early marriage is reduced. With these are the excess cash. You see, our scientists are taking care of the wounded, 
um, uh, turtles, and this is the packaged product. So now the, and I think the purpose of the workshop to highlight some of the research agenda forward. I will not give you the list in details, but I believe environment and climate change impacts, biological productivity and fisheries, artisanal fisheries and social well-being of the coastal fishing communities, good governance. These are some of the most important point. As a very as a sensible person towards the social well-being of the coastal community, I will only emphasize that fish are safety at sea, necessary GPS mobile apps, life insurance, and security from pirates is essential in the Bay of Bengal, Bangladesh territory. Justified wages, share of increased cash should be ensured. Payment for ecosystem services should be introduced. Adequate human support, humanly support should be provided during fishing ban. Family health wash facility should be taken care of. Gender friendly livelihood AIG is provided to the fisher women so that early marriage and GBV stop. And these are the government to take care of. So my colleagues, I have reached to the conclusion of the slide. I'm very grateful to USAID um, as a donor and CGIR um, um, research program on fish and agri-food system fish. We are committed to work together to improve marine biodiversity and fishers livelihood. I believe there are ample opportunity to harness the benefit of the Bay of Bengal for the poorer fishing community and malnutrition and malnutrition suffered people of Bangladesh and the region. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you all. Thank you very Thank much, you very Dr. Wahab. That has been a very complete and, and uh, in-time presentation. Um, considering the amount of information you had on your slide and also uh, Dr. Marsak, it would be great if you could forward us the, um, the slide you prepared so that we can also circulate them at the end uh, of the webinar to all the uh, audience. Um, thank you very much. It's now the time for Dr. Vivekanandal to, um, to present the more governance aspect of all this climate change impact on fish stock and how fish stock assessments and fish stock protection and conservation could be organized. Thank you very much. Yeah, okay. thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Julia, and also to the Iris team for giving me this opportunity to make a presentation. Uh, my presentation will be mostly on the governance aspect, particularly on the strategic actions that would be undertaken for climate change adaptation, as well as fishery sustainability in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, this presentation is mainly from my experience uh, from three institutions, only Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute uh, in India, and then the Bay of Bengal Large Marine Ecosystem Project and uh, the Bay of Bengal uh, Intergovernmental Organization in which, with, with whom I was uh, associated for a few years. So this will be, uh, as I said, mostly on the governance aspects. Uh, before we go into that, I think we should consider three major features of Bay of Bengal, which have to be considered when you talk about the governance. Uh, one is that the region is dense in human population. Uh, the population is somewhere between 1.7 to 1.9 billion, which is about 22% of the global uh, human population. And then all the countries in the region justifiably has given a lot of thrust on economic development in the recent years. And the countries are now preparing or they are planning to prepare for the blue uh, economy that includes uh, marine spatial planning, the deep sea mission, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then the country is, the, the region is rich in biodiversity. Uh, it has the megafauna, it has the critical habitats like the uh, seagrass beds, the mangroves, the coral reefs, 12% of the coral reefs in the globe are in this region. 
and also the mangroves, 8% 8, 8 of the mangroves in the globe are in this region. The annual ecosystem service value from the Bay of Bengal has been estimated as 72 billion uh, US dollars. That shows the rich biodiversity as well as the ecosystem services which this region will be providing. And uh, in this, about 45% comes from the fisheries and about uh, maybe about 12 or 13 percent from aquaculture. The remaining comes from the other sectors like the uh, like the uh, tourism, uh, etc. So this we have to take into consideration when we start planning for the governance issues. And then uh, then the, any governance issue or any strategic action has to depend upon uh, these these elements. And now, uh, as I showed in the previous slide, human high human population density, increasing economic development, as well as climate change act as the drivers uh, for several issues that we are facing today in the Bay. One is the non-climatic stresses like the over exploitation of resources, habitat degradation, pollution and water quality, and then the climatic stresses like rising sea surface temperature, sea level acidification, uh, increasing cyclone intensity and increasing floods and the droughts in the region. And then jointly these issues have major impact uh, on the uh, in the Bay. One is decrease in the productivity, loss of biodiversity, declining fish stocks, as well as the loss of livelihood. In fact, uh, the, the evidences for this, all these, the, the causes as well as the impact is actually increasing. They are accumulating a lot of evidences in this region on, this, uh, on these impacts as well as on the causes, uh, which is both climate related and non-climate related. So you can see that uh, it's not only the climate related uh, issues, but also non-climatic issues, which also have a major say as far as the impacts are concerned. Uh, this has been actually the change, uh, the climate change impacts on fish stocks has been uh, projected by earlier by Dr. Francis Mar Marsek. Uh, there are changes in distribution particularly the small pelagics, the, on the background, you can see that fish, the oil sorting, and that brings about species composition changes uh, within the, between the ecosystems. There are phenological changes. Spawning happens now before the summer months. And then there is early maturity of uh, some of the species, reduction in length of first maturity is noticed. And then there is vulnerable and economically valuable species are uh, declining and then that uh, so there is a need uh, for the fishermen to change fishing practices with higher economic costs as well as reducing the profits now what is required at this stage what is critical to climate change adaptation is that uh, one thing that we have understood in our years of research is that there is uh, there is need for a relief from the current stresses like the overfishing, like the pollution, uh, the habitat degradation, by fully adopting conventional management measures like the closed season restrictions on fishing, on fishing, fishing regulations, fishing effort, etc. So the the idea is the if the ecosystems, the fish stocks, and the communities are healthy, they will be able to adapt to climate change better. Uh, than it is as a uh, as a business as usual scenario. So for this, what is required is full implementation of current regulations or traditional regulations. For example, the Integrated Coastal Zone Management, Marine Fishing Regulation Act, Marine Biodiversity, Marine Protected Areas, and Biodiversity Act. Full implementation of this is necessary if we want to adapt. The, the fisheries, the ecosystem, as well as community to climate change as well. One of the good options could be the ecosystem approach to uh, management, uh, which also addresses the sustainable uh, development. So it has three pillars. One is the ecological well-being and the uh, human well-being, which is balanced by good governance. Uh, so this is, this is the uh, one good uh, option, the EAFM or ecosystem approach to management is a good option uh, if we want to have this uh, 
uh, they, they, they uh, want to have the management uh, she want to have effective management in place the principle of uh, ecosystem approach is to have increased participation of the stakeholders and then appropriate scale can be selected for example is it on a smaller scale or it can be geographical scale could be the fisheries scale uh, so uh, it, it can accommodate different types of scale that is appropriate for the for the objective and then it also addresses the precautionary approach even if we do not have a yeah, hardcore scientific data precautionary approach can be uh, accommodated in this and then the entire plan is adapting we can we can start implementing and we can get, get ourselves adapted when we go along uh, with the plan implementation and then it also ensures cooperation coordination of different agencies different communities at the different levels of management and then it also importantly it has got multiple objectives it can address multiple objectives for example i have given in the box on the left hand side the multiple ob objectives like climate change adaptation fisheries sustainability and livelihood can be accommodated within the eafm depending on the need uh, we can accommodate uh, the uh, multiple objectives uh, in specific areas uh, what is required so this is one advantage which can work well uh, for for sustaining uh, the uh, the uh, uh, of system and then this comes from the uh, the analysis of uh, uh, a summary of analysis is given here of national actions that has been undertaken by eight countries around the Bay of Bengal large marine ecosystem. This uh, data was collected by the Bob LME project and it was also published. So on the left hand side, you can see the objectives, uh, major ob objectives uh, for the uh, sustainability. One is the fisheries uh, and other living resources are restored and managed sustainably. Uh, then critical habitats are restored and conserved. Number three is pollution and water quality are controlled. Uh, number four is social and economic constraints are addressed. The five is institutional arrangements, legal and policy reforms are in place. These are the five objectives for the sustainability. And on the top, you find the national actions to address these objectives. One is the institutional arrangements and legal and policy reforms, and then the management measures that are required, and then knowledge strengthening, awareness and communication, and human capacity development, which is very much required for this uh, for this region. So uh, the marks and the uh, the score has been given here. The score is allotted based on a survey that was. Uh, carried out uh, with the officials, researchers, scientists, as well as the communities, uh, whether these objectives are addressed and what are the actions that are taken uh, to address these objectives. So score has been given and the value that is given in parentheses shows the number, the number of actions and then the, the, the open a number gives you the, the, the percentage. So uh, I think if you go to the right hand, uh, right hand column, uh, the overall uh, score is there. So here you can find that the, for the first objective on fisheries restoration, uh, the countries have either taken up a plan or they are implementing uh, 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 the actions that were envisaged. So that comes to about 70% of the actions are either under implementation or it is in planning stage. And then if you take critical habitats are restored and conserved, 75% of actions are being addressed now or it is going to be addressed. And then pollution related 68%, social and economic constraints 66%, and then institutional arrangements 75%. So overall, you can see that about 72% of, uh, of the actions, uh, of the total number of 215 number of actions, 72% has been either in planning stage or it is being implemented. 
So this is one, one factor which, we, uh, which if uh, any organization wants to take up uh, from where this has to start, any activity has to start. But the challenge, overall challenge that was observed was that implementation, policy on implementation and adapting and improving policy decisions and the policy process was in fact a major challenge in this, in this region. And then the improvements required in governance, there are a few bullet points here. One is integrating climate change adaptation into decision making and the response initiatives, that is, uh, for example, the disaster risk management plans, and then developing capacity at community, mid-level management, and at policy uh, level. This is one important aspect of it has to be given serious uh, thought of, which is an improvement that is required. And then generating quality scientific information, and then improving science policy interface. That is one thing that we find that it is, in, in fact, it is um, uh, being developed, it is improving, but a lot need to be done uh, for the future. And then increasing political priority to management and conservation. And this is going to be a little bit difficult to achieve because the, 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 the political setup in you know, most of the countries, they are now uh, for developing economic uh, business cases more, more in the coastal areas, small, medium, large industries, etc., and tourism. And then there's a need for stronger coordination between fisheries and environmental organizations, which, which is very lacking within, within the country itself. Uh, this is coordination is lacking and more effective enforcement of laws and regulations. Uh, again, the problem here is that uh, there is a lot of uh, huge, uh, density of population, a lot of livelihood that is dependent on the coastal resources. So effective enforcement becomes an uh, actually uh, an issue as a, a challenge on the ground. And then strengthening regional cooperation for addressing transboundary issues uh, is also another uh, major thing uh, uh, that, that needs to be addressed and then improving stakeholder engagement at all levels of governance. Actually, actually there is much, much improvement on including stakeholder engagement, what it was some 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was mostly top to bottom approach. Now, more and more bottom, uh, uh, bottom up approach uh, that is happening now in policy decisions also, as well as for implementing the policies. And having said that, there are dissimilarities as well as similarities between the countries within the region to adapt to the strategic actions. The dissimilarities are the government uh, organizations, processes and priorities are different between one country to the other. The levels of economic development is also dissimilar uh, between the countries. Uh, then the economic agenda is also actually different. Uh, degree of scientific capability and the ability to incorporate science policy interface uh, is also different between the countries. And then patterns of social organization, culture, values are uh, different. And the political relationships with the neighboring states, uh, particularly for the transformative issues, uh, are, are also, uh, is, is also different. It, it gets changed depending on some of the recent events that happens in the, in the region. Uh, but at the same time, one encouraging fact is that there are many similarities as well. Uh, despite these variations that have been listed above, uh, the National Marine Conservation and Utilization Legislation are similar in char characters. The concepts are same. And also, I would say the, 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 uh, the management actions uh, that are envisaged, which are suggested, are also more or less uh, similar. And also uh, the constraints in addressing these uh, measures are also more or less similar between the countries. So maybe there are these similarities can be taken advantage uh, when, we, when, uh, so when we plan for future improving the process. Another major, uh, so major strength of this, yeah of this region is that uh, regional organizations are available. One is the Bob Bay of Bengal Large Marine Project, 
a large marine ecosystem project which functioned from 2009 to 2015. Second phase has just started from this year, from 2021 May, extend for about uh, five years. There are two key documents which have been produced, which is an achievement for the project. One is the transparency diagnostic analysis, and the next one is the strategic action program. Much of the information is available in these two documents, and this can be taken forward. And then the Bear Bengal Program Intergovernmental Organization, which was established in 2013, which is mainly into increasing awareness and knowledge, knowledge practices of coastal fisheries management. They have a lot of information on sea safety measures and then enhancing skills through training and improving the education, transfer appropriate technologies for development of small scale. So these institutions can be taken into consideration. There are strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Uh, the strengths are uh, largely ecologically productive areas, operational specific regional projects, as I mentioned, in addition, we have SAR, BIMSTEC, and APFIC, IOTC as well. And then availability of transparency, these two documents, which I showed. Uh, the weaknesses are that lack of clear policy and coordinated approach between the within and between the countries. Uh, the regional cooperation is weak, and then implementation of management measures is also weak. And then multidisciplinary data, the scientific data is also relatively, it's not a very high quality. The opportunities are that agreement to regional and international treaties, and then learning from international best practices, which can be applied to this region, and then building institutional capacity to work at the multiple levels uh, and also with multiple objectives, and then institutionalizing the transboundary cooperation. These are some ob objectives. Uh, so this, I'm sorry, these are some opportunities. The threats are actually the dense human population, challenge of governance across the sectors and at all, level, at all levels from local to the regional level, and then unsustainable economic development of the coastal areas, and then lack of political commitment because of the stress that is given for economic development, uh, particularly in the coastal areas. The key message is that uh, the strategic actions need to be issue-based, uh, status, status of actions that have been taken so far have to be considered institutional arrangement and capacity of the countries also need to be considered when strategic actions are being uh, strengthened or, and also, uh, uh, also applied uh, to the field conditions. St strategic actions will be effective in countries where conventional environmental and fisheries management measures are well grounded. And then uh, there is also a great opportunity to utilize expertise and services of the regional bodies that are functioning in this uh, in this region. Thank you very much for your hearing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, if you could also send me your presentation because there was a lot of information yeah. in it. Thank yeah. you so much. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm sorry for the delay, uh, Dr. Kleitz, but now your the, the floor is yours for for uh, also bringing some information about the the uh, point of view from IFD on all what have been presented before and uh, marine biodiversity conservation in the area. And um, I invite the other panelists to take, um, to look at the question and answer uh, panel. Uh, we already have a few questions for you for later on. Thank you, uh, Julia, and thank you uh, to the uh, organizer for this opportunity. I think we have we have heard incredible excellence in uh, science, in the application on the ground of solutions, in governance issues, and how all this intertwines to bring biodiversity-based and social-based and governance-based solutions to a very tense and evolving uh, situation. And the job of development agencies development banks such as the French Development Bank is really to provide resources to implement these solutions. This is the key message I want to convey here and uh, show a few examples of what, uh, what uh, we do. So I will just bring rapidly um, some information on the general ocean strategy of the French Development Agency. Zoom a bit to the region of South and Southeast Asia and telling you a few examples of what we finance, both at very grassroots level, sometimes at governance level, 
in the general sustainable blue economy sector. And then I will insist as well on the importance of building key partnerships with a variety of local and regional actors uh, between science, between governance, between grassroots organization and producer organizations uh, to, bring, uh, to bring together a key solution in these uh, difficult times, really. Um, so first, I would like to share rapidly AFD's vision of the ocean. AFD labels a project as an ocean project when its activities are linked to the maritime domain up to 30 kilometers inland from the coast and in the watershed of major river. AFD has acknowledged the importance of protecting the oceans and marine resources, both for environmental and social purposes. AFD ocean strategy is thus compatible with what the World Bank uses as a definition of the blue economy, i.e. the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods, jobs, while preserving the health of the ocean ecosystem. AFD has already committed over 5 billion euros to ocean activities globally between 2008 and 2019, including um, 700 million uh, in 2019 alone. AFD's uh, mandate encompasses strong climate objectives, and specifically in Asia, where the objective of climate co-benefit is 70% for all of our commitments. And the Blue Economy projects are conducive to displaying both environmental and social co-benefits. And AFD ensures that projects benefit the most vulnerable systematically, including gender, climate and biodiversity issues. And as a result out of AFD's ocean projects committed globally in 2019, 37% of the dedicated amount contribute to biodiversity conservation, 66 generate climate co-benefits and 30% of the project contribute to uh, gender issues and reducing gender inequality. To go even further, AFD has committed that 70% of ocean projects will have biodiversity and climate co-benefits by 2025. So AFD has three defined goals in our ocean strategy, to improve the governance of marine and coastal areas and resources, to promote competitive, sustainable and inclusive maritime sectors, and to conserve coastal and marine ecosystems and manage anthropogenic pressure. So as a, as a development bank, these are the key activities of what we can provide, what we can do. Basically, AFD supports both financial and non-financial dimensions of ocean projects. Uh, this package aims at fostering the project's impacts through capacity building, close public policy dialogue with local authorities and stakeholders. With regards to financing projects, AFD really wants to keep promoting traditional and emerging maritime sectors that are competitive, sustainable, and inclusive. In all projects, AFD encourages stakeholders to observe high social, environmental, health, and safety standards. AFD seeks to contribute really to the modernization of maritime sectors in the view of reducing their impact on maritime environments, more efficient ports, unloading facilities, for example, for example, reducing post-harvest and, good, um, uh, and goods uh, losses, contributing to food security and energy efficiency along the value chain. We can also work on um, open up isolated territories to improve their access and their management. Uh, AFD also consider projects targeting the development of marine and coastal activities as a in a sustainable manner. And those activities include infrastructure for the accommodation of ships, aquaculture, renewable marine energies, tourism, submarine cables, desalination plants, etc. Generally, AFD supports projects that focus on the inclusion of women in the blue economy and social justice, particularly among poor coastal communities. AFD has not necessarily done it in South and Southeast Asia yet, but there could be a lot of projects and opportunities targeting especially the reduction of pollutions at sea, plastic, chemical, biological, 
projects could finance freshwater, wastewater, sorry, and solid waste collection and treatment networks. And AFD can also assist with the creation and management of marine parks and protected uh, marine areas to meet the objective of protecting 30% of the world oceans by 2030. We, beyond financing projects, we foster as well public policy dialogue and developing policy-based loans. So it means that in order to efficiently support the sustainable management of fisheries resources, build surveillance capacities, promote the restoration of ecosystem services and adaptation to climate change, AFD really strives to go beyond project finance and foster strong public policy dialogues based on expertise. This could help public institutions to acknowledge the main challenges, appropriate the best standards, share international experience between regions, between countries, and design policies promoting the sustainable management of marine and coastal activities and areas through an ecosystem and co-management approach with my previous speakers have mentioned. So what, what is the activity of AFD in terms of funding um, blue economy project in South and South uh, East Asia? I will just briefly present a few, uh, a few examples. Uh, I won't come back to uh, elements uh, of, of the situation. This has been brilliantly and eloquently um, uh, explained by the previous speakers. The current uh, ocean projects in the region include in Indonesia, several uh, program finance in order to actually better manage the fish resources, uh, limit uh, unreported and um, unregulated uh, fishing, improve the capacity to assess fish stocks um, and improve the capacity to actually follow um, um, uh, the, uh, the, the entire uh, fishing uh, fleet of uh, Indonesia. So uh, we have equipped uh, uh, ships, we have equipped uh, the meteorological and, um, and the climate uh, agencies of uh, Indonesia, uh, and we have uh, helped uh, Indonesia uh, equip itself with uh, surveillance systems, uh, both radar and satellite uh, uh, um, uh, mechanism with quick response to, again, limit uh, illegal unreported um, and unregulated uh, fishing. Uh, we are as well in the region uh, uh, financing through the or Blue Action Fund with colleagues from Germany and Sweden, uh, the protection of marine uh, areas, uh, especially those that are play a key role as nurseries for fish stock production and sustainability. Um, and then we provide as well budgetary uh, uh, finance uh, for key uh, uh, sectors uh, implied in, in uh, combating plastic pollution. So we have committed with a number of other European partners over 2 billion uh, financing for every equipment industries that uh, really reduce the origin of uh, plastic pollution to avoid the, the, the uh, pollution of the oceans. In India, um, we, we are, uh, we are uh, working on uh, technical assistance and exchange uh, with uh, um, uh, on biodiversity and blue uh, economy. Um, and uh, we are being approached at the moment uh, together with the World Bank uh, to finance um, um, uh, programs in the uh, uh, fishing and aquaculture uh, sector. In Sri Lanka, um, we are uh, working on uh, uh, the equipment of uh, harbors and ports, uh, um, four of them actually, uh, uh, 120 million uh, uh, euro uh, investment um, uh, to uh, facilitate the upgrading of these facilities uh, with technical assistance uh, and a number of uh, you know uh, state-of-the-art uh, equipment uh, um, with uh, important social uh, dimensions uh, as well. Um, and then we are as well uh, working uh, more on a, on a sort of a science and technical assistance uh, level with uh, the uh, cooperation services um, uh, of, uh, of um, uh, Sri Lanka, basically to improve uh, uh, socio-ecological management capacity. 
We have some projects as well in Myanmar on uh, the sustainable management of marine and coastal resources through satellite technology. Um, and, um, and are discussing uh, for, uh, for uh, further development in that sector. And in uh, Bangladesh, uh, we are prospecting uh, the possibilities uh, to actually uh, support uh, the request by uh, the uh, Bangladeshi government uh, on blue uh, economy. Uh, in general, we have, um, we have uh, other sectors, uh, I mean, in other regions, quite a large number of activity, especially in the Atlantic Ocean, in the Pacific Ocean, uh, that uh, we could draw experience from. One of my last messages, and I will uh, stop there, is uh, really the importance of, through international cooperation, of really fostering strong partnerships between science, governance, grassroots organization, producers organization, maritime, uh, maritime uh, activities and, and, and actors to really, you know, uh, find the best solutions at all these levels, as we've seen in by our previous speakers, uh, to find the uh, solutions in a tense situation, such as the Bay of Bengal, but in many other marine and coastal areas of the world. So we really uh, insist in bringing together economic stakeholders, decision makers, obviously at all level, and this is not just government official, but as well local authorities. Science is absolutely essential, and we've seen the excellent uh, level of uh, science that is available for good governance, science-based decisions at all levels, and this is absolutely crucial. So we do support as well scientific activities, especially when it's targeted at management and governance issues, both for NGOs at local level, local authorities, government level, and obviously at regional scale. Uh, so important uh, to manage, for example, the large marine ecosystem of the Bay of Bengal. One of the key elements as well is security. And we think that there is no stability and there is no security without you know, sound governance of ecosystems, especially at regional level. And we believe that biodiversity, stability and good management, the sound and prosperous use of this biodiversity and global stability and social and political stability really work hand in hand. So this is why collaborating as well with the military sector is important and dialogue with them with regards to co-benefits in surveillance and ecosystem monitoring can be really uh, work uh, through. And we have as well key, obviously key, um, um, partners to develop with civil society. Women's organization, youth organization, fishermen's organization are some key actors to bring about solutions in an ecosystem-based approach. So we do foster uh, these strong partnerships at regional, national, and local level to bring about ecosystem-based solutions, socially sound solutions, governance sound um, uh, options uh, to um, the difficult situations that a lot of coastal and marine regions in the world are facing. And as we've seen, um, which is the case as well in the Bay uh, of Bengal. So in short, AFD is uh, here to provide resources to facilitate cooperation uh, among uh, local and regional uh, actors uh, to uh, ensure that uh, both uh, the sustainable use of ecosystem, its resilience in a changing world with strong impacts from uh, climate change and security at regional level can work hand in hand and, uh, and, uh, and AFD is here to provide resources to facilitate such uh, processes. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kleitz. So, um, now the, the, the floor is open for questions. Do we have to start with some questions here in the room? If so, please just raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic. Otherwise, I might start with a, with a question. We have around 10 minutes, so that's quite short. But um, if any of the panelists would like to add one or two points for these questions. So it's a question regarding major challenges in setting up 
MPAs, so marine protected areas. Um, so major challenges in setting up MPAs in the Bay of Bengal and how to overcome them. If you have one or two uh, key elements to bring. Dr. Wahab, for example. Yes, please. Um, uh, uh, it's a very good question. And while we are developing marine protected area at the mouth of the three major river confluence uh, in the um, coastal um, uh, inshore marine areas, uh, we got the technical support from IUCN as well as WCS, uh, Wildlife Conservation Society. So uh, we, it's a difficult thing is that we need an in-depth study for years and then we need to delineate scientifically considering the current use, future perspective use, future development, as well as government's plan and multi-ministries plan as well. So bringing the government in institutions together is a very big challenge and over three years of work and uh, good help of these two um, very uh, technically sound organization, we had been able to get it through the government and it is now gazetted. So it is called Nizhum D, Marine Protected Area. And now established and management plan is developed. And now we are going for a marine special planning because there are about 20,000 fishing community households are dependent on those resources. What part of them should be partially closed? What part should be round the earth closed? What part should be kept for the megaphonas? This sort of um, specific plan is being produced and which is challenging as well, as well as bringing the people um, with us, we need to support them because they are very vulnerable people as well to earn their trust because they have been climate affected people. They are uh, living along the edges. So these are some of the uh, problems and constraint and we are trying to address it through the World Fish uh, Bangladesh government's collaboration and the current support we got from USAID. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, you, if, if you allow me, yeah, uh, because there was a question on the on the chat, uh, which was uh, for me for, for that means for a while. So the question was why was the confidence level so low for the northern uh, Bay of Bengal in, the, in terms of the models, the modeling for the climate trends? Actually, the the, the, the answer is uh, is quite easy, but it's in three three fold. Number one, uh, we have a, a large deficit in observations. You know, all these models require observations just to be assimilated in the models and definitely the Bay of Bengal area, especially the offshore regions, are very low in, um, in, in, in number of observations. Uh, the, the, the second aspect is that uh, for, for a while we had a rather low uh, special resolutions in the model and uh, uh, the Bay of Bengal is not very large uh, area, so definitely all the interactions with land uh, create some, some kind of uncertainties. And number three, uh, as I uh, presented, the, uh, the, the Bay of Bengal is a very specific in terms of oceanography, especially with this barrier layer, with a uh, low saline and high temperature. And this actually uh, remove any momentum in the ocean. You can have extreme events developing very quickly. And this is very difficult to, to incorporate. Uh, the El Nino, is quite predictable, so we can put that in the in the equations. But there is other type of uh, variability which I didn't go through because it would be too too, too long. That's uh, intra seasonal variability, and it uh, it is due to play a great role. So this is not well captured, and that's why in some regions like the Bay of Bengal, the models do not perform uh, that well in terms of of prediction. You have less than eighty percent convergence between all the models which are used. Uh, the submarine canyon, uh, I'm not too sure if it was taken in this particular study. Now it will be possible because we have a high resolution uh, uh, models uh, that put together at the range of 25 kilometers. But for the, for the plots that I showed, it was not yet implemented. And there was a question about the shrimp production, uh, aquaculture. And this was something uh, taking the example of Bangladesh. So maybe 
Dr. Wahad can, can answer. It was, uh, the question was, uh, any aquaculture has to be evaluated against ecological impacts, which in this particular case were clearly detrimental. So uh, I don't know, I'm, I don't have all the information. Uh, it's always a kind of trade-off between uh, uh, keeping, you know, environmental friendly and, and developing, you know, uh, economic uh, activities. So that's, yeah, maybe Dr. Wahab, you can, you can continue on that. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Uh, very thank, very uh, shortly, Dr. Wahab, so that we yes, can... Yes, I'll be very short. Uh, Bangladesh coastal region in the southeast and southwest have been used for shrimp farming, that is marine shrimp, as well as freshwater shrimp, ti uh, tiger shrimp, as well as the prawn. Uh, and the, both are doing well, but environmental impacts, as well as the social displacement, as well as the losing of land, salinization, this should be brought under consideration. I would emphasize that the current level of huge extensive farming should be gradually concentrated into semi-intensive farming with better uh, practices. That would help Bangladesh stream to be uh, more productive, sustainable, as well as uh, address the social well-being of the community living on it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vivekan, and then would you like to um, to react on the major challenge for MPA um, yeah, setting uh, very briefly yeah. also? I sent uh, my reply in the chat box as well. But what I what Dr. Wahab said, uh, I, I also endorse his views. Uh, I think in the Bay of Bengal, definitely it is very effective. MPA will be effective, but we do not have hardcore evidence from the Bay of Bengal because not much of evaluation has been done in the Bay of Bengal region. But we have got evidences from other regions that this will be very effective. The challenge is that uh, the, the, the dense population and the dependence on the resources, uh, so it affects the livelihood. So implementation actually becomes uh, a, a problem. Uh, and I think that is the main challenge, I, I would say. Uh, so, okay, thank you. That's all my view. Thank you. Do we have a questions here? No? Okay, then um, to maybe because we'll be on time if we close the session now. So what we'll do is that um, we'll close the session on these uh, final words of uh, Dr. Vivekanandan. Um, we will be back at 11 sharp, so in 10 minutes sharp, um, there'll be a break so you can uh, log off this session and log back uh, in, in five, 10 minutes and we'll be here. Next session, we'll, um, we'll explore um, maritime security and the climate change impact on maritime security in the Bay of Bengal, potential collaborations and avenues for reflection. Uh, we'll have three panelists and it will be chaired by Maria Penondoise, who is uh, now on my left. Thank you very much for attending and presenting. Thank you very much for, uh, for uh, your interest in that topic. Thank you to Dr. Marsac, Dr. Wahab, Dr. Vivekanandan and Dr. Kleitz for their very insightful presentation. Uh, we will continue this conversation, of course, because this is only the first of uh, what we hope to be a long-term research program on that topic. Thank you again, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. So I'm very glad now that we are turning to the session two. Uh, the session two is uh, titled Climate Change and Maritime Security in the Northern Indian Ocean potential collaboration and avenues for reflection, particularly for a sustainable and safe management of marine biodiversity. So uh, I guess that this session will be more focused on interaction between climate change, maritime security, but uh, keeping always in, uh, in perspective the uh, management, the protection of marine biodiversity. And I guess that also during this panel, we will uh, discuss more in depth of the geopolitical reality uh, of uh, uh, the Bay of Bengal. Uh, and uh, we will maybe more easily identify 
uh, new stakeholder um, coming from the maritime uh, maritime uh, security community. I have in mind not only the Navy, but um, the Coast Guard and the Marine Police, because they are taking a great part to the stability uh, and the protection of, uh, uh, of the maritime domain in the Bay of Bengal. And uh, I guess that there are many, many initiatives already ongoing. We do not know uh, all of them. Uh, there are a lot of uh, regional stakeholders uh, having uh, uh, a stake and commitment uh, in maritime security. So uh, I'm very glad to have three very distinguished panelists, uh, which are actually scattered in a very diverse part of the world. I understand that, Jay, you are in the United States. Uh, Dr. Vijay, you are in India. And uh, Rio Admiral Hassan, uh, you are in, in Maldives. So my, my best greeting to, to all of you and thank you for being part of this, uh, of this panel. So we decided the order of uh, our presentation. Uh, first, Dr. Jay Benson. After Admiral Hassan, you will have the floor and we will um, finish by you, Vijay. Uh, and uh, I just remind you to, uh, to keep as, as, as can as you can uh, to your 15 minute of presentation, uh, just to save enough time to, um, to have some uh, a period of question and answer and to facilitate discussion with, uh, uh, with the attendants. So thank you in advance for, for that. Uh, Jay, um, I would like to say a few words to introduce you. Uh, although I guess that you are quite well known by um, any of us. So you, you work as a part of Stabelsys, uh, Stabelsys research team since uh, its inception. You had a focus and um, uh, a level of expertise in maritime enforcement capacity, maritime cooperation, but also the use of maritime domain by violent non-state actors. And uh, you focus uh, actually on the Indian Ocean uh, region, uh, particularly. And uh, I, I would like to say that we, we all know and we all appreciate very much the work of uh, Stabelsys here. And uh, I can mention some of your very famous publication, having in mind the annual state, uh, maritime state on, on, on piracy, uh, your maritime index, and uh, many, many monographs, uh, including one on the Bay of Bengal. And I guess that we were, uh, you were very happy to see uh, this monograph include in the concept notes that uh, Julia drew up for, for us. So Jay, uh, if you want just to begin, uh, the floor is uh, yours for 15 minutes. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just uh, share my screen here. Perfect. Uh, well, thank you, Marianne, for that that very very kind introduction. And let me apologize from the onset from my perhaps unorthodox backdrop. It's a uh, visiting family. It's the middle of the evening, and the garage is the only place I could do this without keeping people awake. So, um, thank you all very much uh, for your time today and uh, for having me here. It, it's a pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to speak with all of you. Uh, I'm here today to discuss some of the work of Stable Seas. Uh, including focusing primarily on the findings of a recent report on maritime security in the Bay of Bengal. So I'll, I'll start with just a brief bit of background. Uh, Stable Seas is a nonprofit research organization uh, which engages international stakeholders in the maritime community with novel research on, on maritime security issues. Uh, we tried to take a comprehensive approach that includes research largely on the nine issue areas impacting maritime security that, that you see here. Uh, these include threats to maritime security, such as piracy and armed robbery and illicit trades, 
uh, as well as mitigating factors such as maritime enforcement capacity and the sustainable development of the blue economy. Uh, by taking a holistic view of these interrelated issues, we hope to develop a more comprehensive understanding of maritime security dynamics for our stakeholders. Uh, our work, uh, as, as Marianne indicated, uh, in, includes the development of the Maritime Security Index, which measures and maps these nine issue areas across a wide geography, uh, as well as regional and issue-specific reports and more fine-grained technical assistance to uh, members of the maritime community. But turning then from our work more broadly to the Bay of Bengal more specifically, um, the report in question um, covers not the nine issue areas previously mentioned uh, across five states in the Bay of Bengal region, um, Sri Lanka, India, Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Thailand. Uh, and we felt that a report focused on maritime security in the Bay of Bengal was uh, important and timely for several reasons. Uh, the first is the region's sheer demographic weight. Uh, as, we've, as we've previously heard. Roughly one in five people uh, around the world live in states along the Bay of Bengal littoral, and the region includes some of the world's fastest growing economies. Uh, maritime security and governance uh, will be a key factor in ensuring that that growth trajectory is maintained and the region's development potential is realized. Uh, the second is the region's uh, increasing geopolitical importance. More and more external actors are recognizing the uh, economic potential and strategic geography of the region, uh, and as a result are, are taking a sharper interest in and increasing their presence in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, and then finally, the Bay of Bengal is an area of growing regional cooperation and policy focus on maritime issues. This makes research which highlights uh, the challenges and the opportunities in the maritime space all the, more, all the more important for uh, informing both national and multilateral maritime policy. So turning then to the findings of the report itself, uh, I thought it might be useful to uh, look at some of the most pressing maritime security challenges in the region, uh, emerging opportunities, uh, and then areas of potential prioritization for improving regional maritime security. So, Looking first at the region's maritime security challenges, uh, four areas, fisheries, illicit trades, maritime mixed migration, and climate vulnerability uh, are worth highlighting. So, so looking first at fisheries, we've obviously heard quite a, a bit about this in much more depth than I can provide. So, um, you know, fisheries are obviously, a crit are obviously critical across the region in uh, ensuring food security and, and coastal welfare. However, when looking at fisheries health in the Bay, a few important challenges arise. Uh, these include pollution from coastal areas, as well as the, the massive watersheds of the many major rivers which flow into the Bay, uh, illegal unreported and unregulated fishing, which costs the region an estimated $10 billion annually, uh, and the need for strengthened cooperative regional fisheries management uh, in order to ensure the, the future productivity of this inherently transnational resource. <clears throat> the second major challenge uh, I'd like to highlight is that posed by illicit maritime trades. Uh, for many illicitly traded products in the Bay of Bengal, um, the area is primarily a transit region rather than a source or a destination market. This seems to be the case for illicitly traded products such as illegal wildlife, uh, products and heroin, for example. However, uh, there are several other trades whose uh, source and destination markets are more closely ingrained within the region. Uh, one example of this is the maritime trade in contraband between India and Sri Lanka. Uh, illegal agricultural chemicals flow from India into Sri Lanka, and in the opposite direction, gold imported under uh, Sri Lanka's relatively low import duties uh, flows to feed the Indian market. Another is the emergence of Myanmar as a major production center for synthetic drugs, including methamphetamine and the local derivative Yaba. Uh, these drugs are then trafficked via the maritime space to markets outside the region, as well as growing to feed a, a growing local demand in Bangladesh, Myanmar, and Thailand. 
Uh, it's important to note that many of these maritime trades in illicit goods are facilitated by the use of fishing vessels. Uh, the sheer number of small fishing vessels in the Bay of Bengal and the difficulty in monitoring, in monitoring their, their activity provides a degree of, of anonymity. Developing more systemic means of identifying potential suspicious behavior by such small vessels could have significant impacts uh, in counter-trafficking efforts. Uh, in addition, the region has been presented in recent years by a crisis in maritime mixed migration. Uh, maritime mixed migration in the Bay of Bengal has a variety of causes. There are economic migrants, primarily from Bangladesh, seeking employment opportunities in Southeast Asian economies. Uh, there are also those driven by conflict and persecution, such as the large Rohingya population, which has settled in camps in Bangladesh, and many now seek a, a more stable uh, life by pursuing a secondary maritime migration to Southeast Asia. Uh, and while it's not yet a significant factor, uh, there is the risk in the not too distant future, given the region's high climate vulnerability, uh, that climate change could cause significant displacement, leading to additional maritime mixed migration. Uh, what's, what's important to note about maritime mixed migration, however, is that regardless of the initial motive for migration or whether migration started as smuggling or trafficking, all irregular maritime migrants in the region are extremely vulnerable to exploitation and abuse in, in a variety of forms. What may begin as voluntary migration can very easily end with violence, extortion, forced labor, and human trafficking. <clears throat> and then finally, climate vulnerability uh, is another overarching challenge which impacts on a variety of maritime security issues. Uh, empirical assessments of climate vulnerability uh, have the region's vulnerability rated well above the global average. This is captured in a, a variety of risks, including um, water salinization, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> uh, sea level rise, increased, uh, increased, increasingly common severe weather events, and, and other factors. These climate issues impact across a broad and varied set of maritime security challenges. Uh, for instance, ocean health and fisheries, uh, <clears throat> ocean health impacts fisheries and the blue economy uh, and thus coastal welfare, which if undermined uh, may force some in coastal communities to turn to forms of maritime crime to meet, their, to meet ends meet. Uh, sea level rise could threaten key coastal infrastructure uh, and cause widespread displacement, leading to increased maritime migration uh, and increasingly common uh, severe weather events at sea and environmental disasters may begin to impact states' ability to uh, deal with maritime crime as their maritime law enforcement entities are uh, must commit increased time and resources to dealing with these climate-related issues. So, Turning then from the challenges uh, to the very significant reasons for optimism regarding maritime security in the Bay of Bengal, uh, two areas stand out as opportunities to be built upon. Uh, the first is the immense potential of the blue economy in the region. Fish fisheries, shipping, offshore hydrocarbons, and tourism all play significant roles in regional economies. <clears throat> uh, what's What's more, blue economic development seems to have increased uh, in importance in recent years as a policy priority for governments across the region. Bangladesh, for example, has convened multiple meetings on the blue economy concept uh, and pushed for greater regional cooperation on blue economic issues. India has demonstrated its commitment to the blue economy through the Sagarmala uh, Investment Initiative, which focuses heavily on the development of port infrastructure. And really across the region, we see states placing increased emphasis and policy priority on the role the maritime space can play in their national economic development. However, uh, climate change and other environmental risks pose very significant challenges uh, to the future potential of the blue economy. Uh, for example, ocean warming and pollution threaten fisheries product productivity and the degradation of the marine environment may hamper the development of coastal tourism industries. 
And of course, this relationship goes in the opposite direction as well. The development of any of these blue economy industries without adequate environmental protections threatens to undermine their, the long-term the long -term sustainability of these industries, uh, and in some cases, their, their economic viability as well. Um, the second reason for significant optimism regarding maritime security in the region uh, is the growing level of regional and, and international cooperation on maritime security and governance issues. Uh, at a bilateral level, uh, cooperation on maritime issues uh, appears strong. Remaining territor maritime territorial disputes between states in the region have been settled via international mediation in recent years, and we see several strong bilateral maritime security partnerships within the region. These cooperative bilateral relationships create a facilitating environment for increased regional cooperation uh, in, on maritime issues as well. BIMSTEC is a, an ideal forum for furthering this multilateral maritime cooperation. Uh, and in recent years, member states appear to have uh, invested renewed political will in BIMSTEC's success. Uh, and the organization appears to be increasingly making climate issues a priority. The group has established a, a center for weather and climate, conducted disaster management workshops, and established a ministerial meeting on climate change. However, the region's ability to address climate vulnerability collectively will depend on the issues moving from agenda items to uh, an area of more substantive regional cooperation. All of these issues really provide ample reason for optimism about the future of the Bay of Bengal as a, a secure and prosperous maritime space. Uh, while serious challenges remain, the region is on a strong footing to address these in a, in a coordinated manner and capitalize on shared opportunities. So looking then to the future, um, one of the important messages we wanted to emphasize with this report is the need to approach all of these diverse components of maritime security holistically. Uh, there are strong relationships between many of these issues. And as such, uh, progress in one area is very often dependent on developments in another. And while these complex relationships uh, make the task facing the international maritime security community more challenging, they may also present opportunities. Uh, by identifying a few key policy priorities that have impacts across issue areas, resources can be utilized to greater impact, uh, and the broad progress can be made across issue areas. Um, given the research we've done, we'd like to highlight uh, three areas of potential prioritization for, for consideration. Uh, the first of these is, is regional ports. Um, region, the security, governance, and, and regulation of regional ports really has a variety of impacts across both economic and security concerns. Uh, on the economic side, current limitations in port capacity and efficiency uh, to a degree hamper regional shipping and trade. Those same issues also uh, generate security concerns as long waits at anchorages can facilitate armed robbery of vessels, uh, and in some places, corruption can facilitate illicit maritime trades. Um, another of these issues, is uh, these kind of overarching issues is maritime domain awareness or MDA, which is was obviously critical to uh, understanding emerging threats in the maritime space and the ability to respond to many of the types of maritime crime already discussed. Uh, and while improvement in this area has been significant in recent years, there are still gaps in regional MDA capacity. Um, the first is the gap between states within the region. Um, while India, for example, has a, a fairly robust uh, MDA system, some other states in the region lack similar resources. Um, this issue could be addressed in part by further maritime security capacity building, uh, as well as information sharing. Uh, the second MDA gap to consider in the region is in regards to small vessels in particular. Uh, as previously noted, small vessel traffic is extremely difficult to monitor uh, and is thus exploited for various forms of maritime crime. 
uh, systems for small vessel monitoring and developing relationships with and reporting structures for civilians both at sea and in coastal communities uh, could be critical in helping to address this gap. Uh, and then the final kind of overarching um, potential policy prioritization is the further strengthening of regional multilateral maritime cooperation. Um, the further development of BIMSTEC, for example, could have impacts across a variety of maritime security issues. Uh, the organization is well placed to facilitate this cooperation because of its geography, the importance it's already placed on maritime and climate change issues, um, and the renewed uh, or the increased prioritization it seems to have received from member states in recent years. Um, however, its, its potential as a platform for regional maritime cooperation is curtailed somewhat by a current lack of resources. Even relatively modest uh, investments in the financial and human resources available to the BIMSTEC Secretariat may have outsized impacts on its ability to drive substantive cooperation on maritime security issues in the Bay of Bengal. So that's all I have for, for my uh, prepared presentation today. Uh, thank you all very much for your time. I, I hope this can serve as a, a good jumping off point for this second session. Uh, if you have questions regarding uh, this particular report or our work more broadly, if you're, or if you think there's ways that we can be of assistance to you and your organizations going forward, you know, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. I, I look forward to the, the discussion session. Thank you very much eh, for this uh, very vibrant uh, introduction and for setting the scene for, for us and uh, bringing some uh, optimism in our exchange, insisting on the cooperation, which is quite a, a, positive, uh, a, a positive perspective for, for us because we would like to establish a better interaction and uh, well, to know better uh, the architecture of the region and maybe to reinforce uh, some, some weak aspect. And we already have mention of, uh, well, the weakness of the law enforcement, as you underlined, the gap in the maritime domain awareness. And I, I'm sure that we will come back on that in, uh, in, our, in our discussion. But what I, uh, I take also, it's uh, the holistic approach that, uh, more or less, uh, you 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 are uh, uh, you are developing by having a, a global a global view and uh, praising for uh, regional cooperation. So I'm turning now to our second speaker, Admiral uh, Nazmul Hassan. Admiral, I, I will just introduce you in a few words before letting you the, the floor. I would like the audience to know more about you. You are a serving naval officer of Bangladesh, uh, Bangladesh Navy, and you are currently assuming the duty of High Commissioner of Bangladesh in the Maldives, and you are there posted since March 2021. Uh, and uh, in your very, very long uh, Navy officer career, you served in various staff, instructional and command appointment at different level, but you also have time to elaborate about maritime security. So you write and you speak on maritime security and regional cooperation on a very regular basis. So we, we very much welcome your participation to this workshop, Admiral as a senior naval officer from Bangladesh and with your high diplomatic responsibility in the Maldives, you are bringing uh, uh, the perspective of uh, two very significant countries uh, to, uh, to our exchange, Bangladesh and, and Maldives. So the floor is, uh, is your Admiral. Thanks very much, Marianne, uh, for kindly introducing me to the audience. And I also thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this platform as a panelist today. Ladies and gentlemen, the topic of our discussion has a number of important facets. It includes the climate change, maritime security, marine diverse, biodiversity, and potential collaboration. As a practitioner in the maritime security field, I would be rather inclined to focus on maritime security and potential collaboration within the region and beyond. 
but of course the impact of climate change will essentially also appear in my discussion. To start with, um, let's uh, talk about very briefly about the geopolitical realities in the region because um, Mr. Benson has already deliberated in details. I'd only say that the um, geographical importance of the region in terms of uh, sea lines of communication for the transportation of essential materials and energy resources cannot be overstated. We also need to note that uh, Bay of Bengal literals are some of the uh, least developed countries or developing countries, and they have the intent of economic well being uh, to be ensured for their people. And for that, there are the bounties in the ocean the untapped living and non-living resources that needs to be explored and exploited by these countries. All these and many other factors attract the uh, regional and the extra-regional powers towards the Bay of Bengal. At, and at times these influencing powerhouses operate bilaterally with in, uh, individual countries or on occasions they take a collaborative framework approach. The development of the concept of Belt and, Road, Belt and Road Initiative of China, including the Maritime Silk Road, is one such example. And we have also the um, Indo-Pacific strategy and the revival of the quadrilateral alliance called the Quad, where USA, India, Japan, and Australia, the members, to work together in a common platform to work in this region. As far as the uh, literal states are concerned, most of them have to work on a fine line and they have to master the art of the balancing act because end of the day, it is about the national interest for each of them. So there is always a complex interplay between the geopolitics and the geoeconomics. Let us now look into the um, maritime security issues through the prism of a practitioner. In the Bay of Bengal, there are no serious issues of contention among the literals, not at least in the maritime sector. There may be issues like the Rohingya crisis on land. And fortunately, most of the maritime boundary claims have already been settled between countries. And now countries are able to focus on exploitation of the untapped resources from the seabed and the subsoil. As such, it can be safely stated that the traditional security concerns are not prevalent in any worrying degree in the Bay of Bengal. However, the non-traditional threats remain in the form of illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing, trafficking of arms and narcotics, human trafficking, piracy in a limited scale, armed robbery or theft, and finally, the possibility of maritime terrorism. In addition, there are concerns of safety and security of the sea lines of communication, oil and gas rigs, and all other offshore and coastal assets, not to mention the requirements of search and rescue, the humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, and the marine pollution control, etc. Although addressing these challenges in the maritime domain are the primary tasks of the Coast Guards, but in practice, in most countries, the navies take care of the maritime domain. And this essentially means that there is a requirement of capacity enhancement of the law enforcing and the security agencies in the maritime sector of the literals. The other takeaway point here is that the non-state actors or the wrongdoers do not limit themselves within the boundaries of a particular maritime country. As such, there is an urgent need for regional and at times extra regional cooperative framework among government agencies and maritime stakeholders. In absence of which it is rather difficult to mitigate the challenges and the security concerns at sea by individual state. As a matter of fact, the maritime security concerns have widened from pure security to include economic and environmental issues as well. And that brings us to the next point of looking at the changing natural environment in the Bay of Bengal. I would divide the major issues of concerns into four broad categories. The effects of the climate change on the sea and the coastal area, the effects on the weather, weather pattern, effects on the marine biodiversity, 
and finally the effects on the population. I believe the esteemed audience are well aware of the general impact of climate change in the maritime arena. So I will be specific to the cases of Bangladesh and to some extent Maldives for drawing my examples. Bangladesh with its uh, 700 kilometer long coastline and numerous rivers and water bodies are at risk for the sea level rise. The sea level rise by the slightest margin is already causing salinity intrusion and higher degree of erosion in the estuaries of major rivers and tributaries. This in turn is reducing the river flow and causing added siltation. And therefore, each year, almost each year, Bangladesh experiences huge amount of flood of the deltic plain. The effects of sea level rise for Maldives is even more worrying because the island state is only between three to six feet above the sea level. Therefore, a marginal sea level rise will actually cause them concerns in their mere existence. The second issue here is the change of weather pattern. I remember as a young naval officer before three and a half decades, I used to be able to go out to the sea with my smaller craft of 200 to 300 tonnage for almost throughout the year, except a couple of months in the monsoon. But I remember as late as 2019, when I was the fleet commander, it was difficult for me to plan exercises with the smaller craft because for most of the year, like eight, eight nine months, the weathers remain unpredictable and the extreme weathers like the tropical cyclones are becoming more and more frequent in the Bay of Bengal. Now these changes in weather pattern has three impacts in three different dimensions. For the poor fisherman, it increases the risk of his safety of life at sea. And with no modern gadgets for weather prediction or for the position fixing, they remain increasingly vulnerable at sea. So there is a requirement of addressing this issue of smaller vessels operating. And for the perpetrators of the wrongdoers, now he can operate almost throughout the year, taking disguise of the foul weather, of course, with a little bit of added risk. So what is the implication for the law enforcing agencies like the Navy and the Coast Guard? The implication is now we need to look for larger platforms, the platforms which are more stable and with higher tonnage so that we can operate round the clock throughout the year. And better even if we have the capacity of maritime surveillance augmented by the coastal radars or the capacity of the aerial surveillance by the maritime aircrafts. So we are talking about essentially the infrastructure development to enhance maritime domain awareness and not to mention the additional expenditures that comes with it. And that is why the collaboration and support from region and beyond is absolutely necessary for the littorals. So that brings me to the next point of the impact of marine biodiversity. I believe in the first session, we heard uh, detail, in details about the impact on the fisheries and the cause of fish migration. So I'll not dwell on that. I'll only mention that the uh, largest mangrove forest of Sundarbans, which is housed by the eastern coast, southeastern coast of Bangladesh and part of India is under threat because of the salinity intrusion and a little bit of sea level rise. And this mangrove forest, which also houses a large variety of wildlife, including the Royal Bengal tiger, are literally at risk because of the climate change. What is the case of Maldives? In Maldives, once I arrived here last year, I came to learn that in the northern atolls, some of the species of the mangrove are dying for unknown reasons. And Maldives needs all the expertise from the neighboring countries or beyond who can help them in saving these mangroves. Now about the impact on the coral reefs, luckily Bangladesh has only one coral island at St. Martins, but for Maldives, there are 1200 islands made of the coral reefs. And that is why the coral bleaching because of the uh, rise of the ocean water temperature and the ocean acidification is a threat of existence for the coral reefs and in turn for the country of Maldives. Finally, the impact on the population of the littorals. 
the coastal population in the northern Bay of Bengal, consisting of Bangladesh, a uh, couple of the Indian states of West Bengal and Odisha, and that of Myanmar, form the large uh, population in the Deltic Plain. And Deltic Plain, and because of the coastal degradation, the coastal instability, and increased frequency of extreme weather like the tropical cyclone, and finally the minimizing livelihood uh, opportunities for them are causing these coastal belt population to migrate further inland. And this in turn is causing added pressure to the already overpopulated cities and towns of India, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. In a nutshell, the impact of climate change on countries like Bangladesh and Maldives are enormous. And that is why it's not in wonder that people are calling the climate change a threat multiplier for the literal states. So what are the countries doing to mitigate or to address this situation? Are they doing enough? As you know, Maldives was the uh, founding chair of Climate Vulnerable Forum, which began its journey in the year 2009. And currently, the Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Sheikh Hasina, is the president of CVF. Both the countries are also members of B20, the top 20 nations who are most affected by the impacts of climate change. Within the country, both the governments are trying to adopt whole of government approach to mitigate the causes of concerns, causes and concerns of climate change. There are also efforts being taken to put more and more focus on the planning and implementation of new economy for sustainable development. Is it enough for countries to act individually or independently to address all issues of concerns we talked about? Clearly it is not. And that brings me to the last point of my discussion, some thoughts on the potential collaboration between countries within the region and from beyond. We all are aware that the cooperation between countries may be at different level of levels of political, diplomatic, scientific, law enforcement, and so on. On a broader platform, we have heard a little bit from Mr. Uh, Jensen, uh, Benson regarding the BIMSTEC, and I believe we'll hear more from Mr. Sakuza. The IORA is there, Indian Ocean Commission, Bay of Bengal Large Marine Ecosystem Project, and the like. However, I shall talk about the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and the heads of Asian Coast Guard Agencies meeting, in short, called the HAGAM, and some specific events that are taking place within the littoral countries focusing on Bangladesh. IONS had its first symposium in 2008 with India as its host. Bangladesh was the fifth chair between 2016 and 2017-18. In 2017, Bangladesh conducted the first ever field exercise for the IONS on search and rescue where the member countries and the navies participated. On the other hand, the head of Asian Coast Guard Agency meeting provides opportunities for networking and information sharing among the Coast Guards of 22 member states. These two collaborative framework among the law enforcement agencies and the security agencies of the Indian Ocean Littorals can play a major role in maritime collaboration and cooperation within the region. The areas may include, but not be limited to, search and rescue, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, implementation of the concept of white shipping, countering piracy and possible terrorism, but most importantly, sharing of information in the maritime sector. Talking about information sharing, in my understanding, the idea of information sharing is by far the most important aspect of bilateral and multilateral cooperation. May I make a mention here that the Southeast Asian countries are setting the standard, both in terms of maritime collaboration and information sharing. In South Asia, the countries work together in tri-service, uh, in trilateral, quadrilateral, and multilateral cooperative frameworks. The RECAP Information Sharing Center and the Information Fusion Center in Singapore are two exemplary models of effective physical infrastructure aimed at information sharing. The IFC IOR established in December 2018 in Gurugram, 
India is a laudable step to that direction. I would expect, or we should expect, that the countries from the region and beyond will join this network sooner than later. Meanwhile, on a bilateral front, Bangladesh conducts regular maritime events and exercises and dialogues with the neighboring countries and with the countries from beyond the region. Foreign warships visiting Bangladesh ports carry out regular exercises with the Navy and Coast Guard ships and aircraft. Some of these events are regular in nature, while the others are availed when opportunity arises. For example, with the Indian Navy, a coordinated patrol of the maritime border are carried out on a regular basis. India also has trilateral maritime security construct with countries like Sri Lanka and Maldives. And recently, Seychelles and Mauritius are being added to this network. Ladies and gentlemen, I think I'll make my concluding remarks at this stage. The Bay of Bengal has always been an area of uh, significant geostrategic importance to all concerned. The evolving geopolitical realities and the impact of climate change pose some serious concerns to all stakeholders, primarily within the region and also from beyond. Especially the impact of climate change brings in a series of unprecedented challenges for all of us. It is therefore time for us to sit together, share our information, our knowledge, our expertise and technical know-how for a better tomorrow not only for ourselves, but also for our future generations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anil. Thank you really for giving to us some, I will say, practical e example of uh, the nature of cooperation in the maritime domain. So you underline the political, uh, uh, political bodies, uh, meaning IORA and BINSTEC, uh, which are committed to develop maritime security thinking and maritime security exchange. But also, um, I'm glad that you introduce uh, the perspective uh, offered by a security initiative uh, with the Navy, uh, with the Coast Guard, and that you, you mentioned a, a very concrete uh, cooperation with the development of a maritime and fusion center in the region, because this is really something that we, we took from all of the presentation which have been done till now, uh, this uh, need to better understand the maritime domain, uh, to control the maritime domain, but also has a first level of cooperation, obviously, uh, to share information uh, between all of the of the state, all of the agency and stakeholder, um, which are uh, working for uh, a better, I will say, um, uh, better development of a regional blue economy, uh, which is uh, the, the major stake for for the region. And I'm very glad that you mentioned the effort of India with the implementation of the fusion center. Um, in, in New Delhi recently, uh, Singapore as the uh, first one fusion center. And maybe I could add uh, for the Western part of Indian Ocean, the Madagascar fusion center. And here with that global picture, we had already a, a very promising um, maritime architecture, but I, I, I let this for, for the for the discussion. And without uh, any more comment, I will uh, I will turn to you, Vijay, now, uh, and introduce you in a few words. Uh, Dr. Vijay Sakuja is the former director of the National Maritime Foundation. We all know already uh, of this syntax because we have already have an exchange with the National Maritime Foundation. Uh, you are on the faculty of a very, um, very number of think tank and university, not only in India, but abroad. You are a former Indian Navy officer, and you have published very extensively on uh, naval affairs, maritime security, climate change. And you had a very recently um, edited volume and one on the Sea of Collective Destiny, Bay of Bengal and Binstek. And I guess that maybe you are going to develop some of the substance of your book 
for um, our our attention. So the floor is your uh, Vijay. Thank you, Marianne, for this uh, kind introduction. Also, let me thank Julia for this opportunity. Uh, I, I think the subject is such a fascinating one, and uh, I le let me very briefly recall when I wrote my first book on uh, Bay of Bengal way back in 2015. I titled it to read as Bay of Hope and Fear. I was pretty confused. I didn't know whether it's going to be going to be a great place or not so great place. But after having four years after later, when I published my next the, the last book, I call it Sea of Collective Destiny. Over the years, I find much has happened. I think it is a very evolved region in terms of matters maritime. And in that context, I'm going to share with you uh, my presentation. Um, let me share it. Uh, sorry. Very well. Very well. Okay. So, uh, you know, having said that, you know, I realized that my co panelists have said it all. When they have said it all, there's little left for me. But then uh, let me put it out. Uh, what I've done is if you see the slide, I put it in four distinct baskets. One, of course, is maritime security, climate change, and of course, linked to that is biodiversity. And I'll talk about multilateral initiatives. Uh, this will help us. My first uh, argument that I make is trying to understand what is maritime security. It is just evolved. It's a subject which is ongoing. It is starting. As a matter of fact, we find it's genesis. We still don't have a, a good definition of maritime security. We are still toying with the idea, how do we go about doing it? And to my mind, I put it in three typologies, competitive maritime strategy, maritime security, cooperative, convergent. And when you talk of competitive, it is classic security where you bring in lots of issues concerning naval power. And there is, there are also in terms of their sustaining the power or they're challenging the rising, uh, a rising actor is generally state versus the state. Then when you talk about cooperative, we bring in, we are all coming together to fight against violent non-state actors. And that brings us into the basket of asymmetric threats and challenges. Convergent, that is where we come in the concept called delivery of public goods. We offer search and rescue, we offer HADR services. We don't charge them. It is all delivery free of cost. And when I look at Bay of Bengal, I find them that the three types of typologies appear. Maritime security, there is maritime safety and marine protection. And when I look at marine maritime security, we, my co-panelists have said boundary disputes are gone. We don't have much problem. WMD proliferation is not there. Cyber and drone attacks, we are not yet being confronted with, but certainly we are, there is a certain naval buildup States are acquiring submarines, high-end platforms for various national reasons. That's not my purpose to say why they are arguing for it and acquiring it. But I think so in the same breath, I must say, while there is some kind of a place of calm, we are Bengal, but in the same breath, I must confess, there is going to be some kind of influence of the contestation which is going on in the Western Pacific. That is great. Power engagements are taking place. The reverberations and repercussions will be felt here. My uh, admiral did mention about the port. He talked about the Indo-Pacific strategy. Now, these are going to be there with us, but then they're all state-driven. It's again up to the littorals of the Bay of Bengal how they want to handle it. My next talk, uh, issue is concerning about violent non-state actors, piracy, terrorism, drugs, IUU, trafficking in persons. I think these are there. For that matter, these appear in any body of water in different forms. I would still argue that they are not at that level what they were earlier. I think we've, we have low level of piracy and Bangladesh offers a great, great example in terms of having brought the so-called, again, piracy and so-called uh, armed robbery. We make a distinction and it's gone off there. Drugs, guns, because we are between, we are close to a center where there's enough of drugs are produced. So it comes in, IUU fishing is at a very, very low level and trafficking in persons. Yes, again, we've already heard about it and I'll talk about it later. But when it comes to the issue of maritime safety, we are also victims of rather, you know, we should say, we, we, fear, we have the impacts of tsunamis. We've had that one in 2004. Cyclones appear regularly. As a matter of fact, two months ago, we had the Yas cyclone hitting Indian, India's East Coast. And I, in the same breath, I must say, Cyclone Nergis, we lost in Myanmar 180,000 lives. In Yas, we just lost about 14. So states around the Bay of Bengal have developed 
enough capacities, capabilities, methodologies to respond to such, these are nature driven, you can do nothing about it. Third was the last one is man-made. And that is where I'm going to focus on. That is in terms of what we are talking of. Sorry, one more. Climate change, sea level rise, connected, marine environment degradation. I'm going to refer to again in terms of marine debris and litter, ocean acidification and impact of bi biodiversity. Sorry. So when I look at the Bay of Bengal and in terms of American security and safety order, I think I have a good story to talk about. I think the most of the countries are socialized into maritime security and safety issues. Uh, there are several of them are members of the IORA. They're part of the BIMSTEC, as I'll talk later. ASEAN, SARC. So they've already gone into a process what they use these strategic summits, dialogues, communiques as political diplomatic strategic tools to uphold maritime order in the Bay of Bengal. There are also members of the INS. There is also the congregation of Milan where Southeast Asian navies come in. They're also part of the ADMM plus in Southeast Asia, conduct variety of activities, which Admiral has mentioned. And also they're also proficient now in terms of search and rescue, HADR. As a matter of fact, they've graduated to a level that are about a four IR as I conceptualize to read as a rescue, relief, rehabilitation, and reconstruct. In a sense, Bay of Bengal can be proud of and talk boldly about disaster diplomacy, which has evolved and they are in good capacity to deliver public goods at sea. This is about the American security and safety order. Let me move on to the next aspect called what I call as marine protection. But before I do that, I thought it would be a good idea to look at global risk landscape 2021. The top two rows are about risks and the bottom two are impacts. And if you look at the top two rows, first to the 10th, you find four out of 10 are concerning environment. Two of them, three of them concern digital. One of course, infectious disease, and there is interstate relations fracture that is geopolitical and societal livelihood. If you see the concentration is more on environmental issues and look at the impacts again, out of the 10, again, you have five, 50% are concerned with the so-called the environmental domain. There is one little geopolitical domain, as I said, WMD proliferation, WMD, WMDs, I think that we don't see in the Bay of Bengal. Of course, infectious disease, we've seen that. Uh, we are in the, in, in, within the, we are well within, in the, in the rather pandemic, uh, COVID-19. Then there is debt crisis, et cetera. So you find among the top 10 challenges, risks and the impacts, and we look at it, it is the environmental issue. And that is what my focus is going to be on. Now, uh, we are already familiar with the fact that uh, mangroves are an important issue. They are thinning, they're dying because of sea level rise. They're thick because of thick population growth also around. Very interestingly, in this part of the world, we've lost an island. This was the fifth island in Sundarbans, which was lost due to sea level rise, South Kalpati. And that ended also so-called contestation or boundary dispute between India and Bangladesh. One fine day, it just vanished. But then we also have a good story to talk about. There is this one island, Gulf of Manar, between Sri Lanka and India, that we've been able to salvage one island. So there's, again, technology, we are able to do that. So while, while there is going to be sea level rise, it's going to be a, a major challenge and a major issue for the way of what I call littorals, but also we have a success story, probably there are good practices good businesses that have been brought in, technology which has been brought in, that they are trying to salvage the one island. Suffice to say, Sundarbans region is very, very fragile. And they've already lost about 25% of the mangroves due to erosion over the past three decades. Most of the erosion is permanent, ladies and gentlemen. Physical damage caused by increasing frequency, intensity of extreme events also impairs the potential comeback. Can we think, can, can we, dread the whole idea about climate refugees. Now, this was a concept which has been there prevalent for a while. And we saw that the emergence of climate refugees, the talk about it in the Maldives, that was during President Shahid's time, Rashid's time. When he talked about where will we go? What are we going to do? That was time he was bringing the whole attention about Maldives losing island territory to rising sea levels. There was also talk of leasing territory in India or in Sri Lanka or all the way going to Australia. Now, 
this is going to be an issue. Climate refugees will be an issue. This is going to be confronting whether we like it or not, despite our technological advances and having managed the affairs of the islands, such as the case of Guam Island. And then we already have the Rohingya issue. Now, this is the kind of migration, illegal, irregular, whole lot of economy driven or variety of domestic causes for it. We're going to see migrants as what are going to do. The way we've been pushing out the Rohingya refugees, we've seen that example in Southeast Asia. Will, what, what are we going to encounter about this? My next issue is, uh, let me say in these many words, Bay of Bengal is gasping for oxygen. Insufficient oxygen, it loses uh, growth, reduces growth, increases disease, and it was going to affect the entire, what I would call as marine life. Oxy it is also affects on the quality and quantity of the habitat. These are going to be there. And if you look at it in Bay of Bengal, 60 kilometers, square kilometers, at the depth of 70 kilometers, we already are in a dead zone. And this dead zone, if we see, is just not in Bay of Bengal. If you see the second tablet, you find it's there again in the Gulf of Oman. It's on either side. And OMZ, oxygen minimum zone, is more intense in the Bay of Bengal than in the Arabian Sea. High loads of pollutants coupled with diminution of fish, Several rivers are simply emptying. And what is coming down from the rivers is sewage, untreated, industrial waste, agriculture, aquaculture waste, industries, and not to forget microplastics are plenty in the Bay of Bengal. Also, when we are going to see this limitations in terms of not enough fish, and fish don't know any boundaries, we're going to be having states now lined up together to defend their fishermen, or when they venture out, into each other's ease that we have this process of phenomena which is happening which happens frequently in the Sir Creek area uh, between India and Pakistan as also between India and Sri Lanka. So we're going to be the navies, the coast guard, the marine law enforcement agencies are going to be looking at hot pursuit of fishermen. That's where tensions are going to rise. Now talking about the plastic, this is a subject which I've been studying for a while now. I find that the Bay of Bengal is more polluted than the Indian Ocean Gyre. And also about 15,000 tons from the Arabian Sea moves into the Bay of Bengal. So it is all getting collected here. So you have about four major rivers, Ganga, Brahmaputra, Meghna, Iravati, they are all draining. And also it comes in from Kelani Ganga, Valavate, and the Hival Canal in Sri Lanka. What is happening is all this plastic pollution is taking place. But we have little information on type of marine debris or material type for monitoring it. This is a big, big weakness in the Bay of Bengal area. Interstate understandings and response, including through structured multilateral organization, is right now absent. But what we need is there are some, some initiatives which are going where we talk about recycling, reusing, and repurposing. And we also have good stories of community intervention. If you see the picture on the right top, you have a very interesting story. This is a picture which I pay, which I got this morning. It's about off Thailand, where fishermen have discarded the fishing nets. They're over coral reefs, and it's become a very difficult for the navy divers to remove the nets simply because when they remove it, or rather indiscriminate in removing it, they're going to damage the damage the corals. So it's a big big challenge. As a matter of fact, I would call it fishermen are the problem. At the same time, in the same breath, fishermen are the solutions also. Below are three pictures. This is what's happening, that we have whales washing, dolphins washing ashore. This, the first picture is of India, South India, Tamil Nadu. The second picture is from Bangladesh, April this year. And the third picture is the Indian Coast Guard engaged in getting the so-called marine debris left by fishermen. So if you look at pictures on the right one and two, I think fishermen have a major role to play. And here again, what would be needed is in terms of sharing knowledge, information, education, a whole lot of interventions can come in. And also there is a big role for community intervention on the waterfront of keeping the waterfronts clean and free of plastic. Well, um, some things has been said about BIMS tech, well, it is evolving. It's been in business for the last literally two and a half decades. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, 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 it was more of a pariah for some time. It's only after that the SARC did not make any progress, that we found the South Asian countries started gravitating towards BIMSTEC. And BIMSTEC is now evolving. They come out with summits. They come out with statements. 
They're very, very enterprising. They have about 14 priority areas. They began with six focus areas, but they have 14. And if you see each one of them has got a relationship with matters maritime or the oceanic domain. And so here, BIMSEC has an opportunity to play. Uh, each priority area has a chair country and they are uh, for specific project facilitation. Uh, they also have expert groups. And here at the bottom, you find that expert group can invite representatives from public and private sector and a regional and international organization to its meeting whenever deemed so. I think that could be a growth path, a growth area where several opportunities come, say from the United States or from European Union, from France or other European countries or from Japan. And this is what is going to be a success story. The partnerships are going to be developed. So what do they do? BIMSEC has highlighted blue economy uh, and uh, they have also talked about uh, setting up an expert group to develop an action plan for blue economy. And mind you, if you see that they also, we also have in the BIMSEC landlocked countries. Now they're also member states. They also have respond, they also have interest in the oceans. As a matter of fact, very much connected to the whole climate circle, climate exchange, Himalayas, mountain economy and oceans. They're interconnected. To that extent, I think climate is the one which is binding us, whether in the oceanic domain or in the mountain domain. And of course, India and Bangladesh have signed this uh, maritime cooperation agreement at the BIM sector. So what you find is there is engagement at the bilateral level, at the trilateral level, and also at the multilateral. So that way, multilateralism has evolved. It's at a very infant, it's, it's in its infancy, it is evolving, developing, and I, I believe it has got a great opportunity. Let me also share with you a very interesting development which has taken place in the last two years. India has announced the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative. First reaction, the moment Indo-Pacific comes in, we look at through the prism of competitive security. Well, this isn't. It's open, inclusive, non-treaty-based global initiative for mitigating challenges, especially in the maritime domain. So it is focused for the maritime domain through practical cooperation in seven thematic areas. And if you see, it has the maritime security, ecology, resources, disaster risk reduction, capacity building, resource sharing, SNT, trade connectivity, and transport. Now, if you look at this, these are all what we are talking about in the Bay of Bengal. So there is an opportunity within the Bay of Bengal itself to participate and partake from the IPOI. And as a matter of fact, we have great responses coming in. Uh, it's been welcomed by Japan, by the, uh, by Australia, and now recently by France. Welcome France decision to join IPOI. This is the summit in uh, uh, meeting, summit meeting which happened in April this year, uh, taking the lead in marine resources pillar. Acknowledge Australia's lead in the marine ecology pillar. Japan has chosen the connectivity pillar. Indonesia has got an opportunity to come for another sector. Singapore is being offered. So here are opportunities available for anybody and every, given the fact that it is open, inclusive, and non-treaty based initiative. IPO, I can potentially trigger cooperative agendas in the Bay of Bengal. And I find FPIPI, that is a short for, although the French have not used it, I call it French Partnership in Indo-Pacific. At its heart lies strengthening ties on the basis of converging visions and shared interests. It's here, we already have a framework between France and the India, and of course the Bay of Bengal, where we can bring in a whole lot of IPOI as an opportunity. BIMSTEC has an opportunity, FPIP has an opportunity. So here we get a, a concentrated form of cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, this is my last slide. What we need to do is, there are always urge to say, you do this and do this and do this. Surely enough, it has appeared in the slides, networking to expand, improve monitoring climate induced changes in the day. This you will find in any other slide. And if I don't do it, if I don't write it, that means I'm short of not even suggesting the science. We need technical cooperation. We need regulatory cooperation, capacity building, planning, maritime law enforcement. This is where navies and coast guard, my co panelists have said in those many terms, law enforcement, technical legal education is important. Marine pollution, shipping regulation, other technical issues, they all got to be told, talked, discussed, limitations, opportunities, all, which of course we're all signatory to the, we are part of the UN and there the IMO gives us enough opportunity to look at each one of them. Capacity building in the, ladies and gentlemen, I've chosen not to use the word MDA. I call it marine domain awareness. Why? 
because there's a lot to be done in the Bay of Bengal. We need to be, as I said in the first one, understanding the ocean, climate-induced changes, biodiversity, fisheries, whole lot of issues. There is only one prism, whereas MDA gives us one, which is equally important, extremely important MDA, and we have had great successes. It is now time to talk about marine domain awareness, which is going to give us much more holistic approach to looking at the oceans and seas. There we require training, we require infrastructure, we need to build this capacity for it. And where do these capacities? We've done enough of it. I think there's an opportunity gives us in terms of industry 4.0 technology, artificial intelligence, marine uh, machine learning, we're talking about AI, AVVR we are talking about, big data we are talking about, digital twinning we are talking about, they're all going to be supporting the blue economy. Finally, track one and track two dialogues are critical. They have to focus on security, not to forget MD, as I said, is critical, blue economy. Marine spatial planning, very, very critical. It requires education, sharing of knowledge, expertise, sustainable resource development. And I, where do they come? At several levels, bilaterally, trilaterally, multilateral through BIMSTEC, IORA, IPOI, as I said, Indian Initiative, FPI, IP in terms of French partnership, AOIP, the ASEAN outlook to it. So here are several opportunities in which we are able to build a practical cooperation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Vijay, for this uh, very, uh, uh, very extensive presentation uh, and your concluding remark uh, offering uh, many avenues for, for cooperation uh, already. And um, I took your, your mention regarding, uh, well, the Indo-Pacific Ocean Initiative, uh, which is quite maybe new for us and uh, which need to be, to be explored a, a little further. And the same from the French partnership for the Indo-Pacific. Uh, these are maybe new, uh, new, new initiative. Uh, but as you mentioned, um, track one, uh, security and maritime dialogue uh, are also a very interesting tool uh, just to know, uh, to know better each other. As, uh, as this workshop, uh, as this workshop today, uh, for better information uh, regarding what is already done and where maybe uh, France uh, AFD can fit in, uh, just to 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 bring uh, some uh, some more cooperation. Uh, but what I have in mind has a first question, uh, and um, it is your your matrix. The security matrix, uh, risk matrix that, that you show on, on your, your screen is to have a clear view on the uh, agenda security and the hierarchy of priority uh, for all of the states uh, in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, because you, you, you mentioned, um, you mentioned, I already lost my, my note. You, you mentioned extreme weather as a, a first preoccupation, the first concern. And this is what I can took from uh, all of the speakers this, this morning, clearly. And as a second, um, as a second uh, risk, uh, infectious disease. And in this time of pandemic, of course, it is obvious that this is really um, an enormous, huge concern, and, and not only for the Bay of Bengal, of course. But what I also see, uh, is a, a kind of a, a very hard security concern when we are speaking about drug trafficking, when we are speaking about drug, um, uh, drug trafficking, weapons trafficking, human trafficking, but also piracy. Uh, I think that uh, maybe uh, we are maybe undermining uh, this task uh, for the country to, to carry on. And that as we are uh, having this topic devoted to climate change, we are putting too much attention on climate change um, in comparison to uh, many other maritime security issues that are maybe higher on the agenda security of the, of the state, uh, even if uh, there is a, a, a clear perception and a clear link uh, between security uh, and, and blue economy, uh, clearly. 
and blue economy, this is not only EU fishing, uh, this is uh, the protection of tourism, uh, which is a, a part of great income outcome for, for, for the region. Uh, speaking of Maldives, for example, or, uh, or port security, because the transport, you, you mentioned that strategically the Bay of Bengal is at the a, a core uh, of the sea lane of communication, and this is a, a very uh, important part. So I would like really to, to have your view regarding this agenda of security and the tendency since the very beginning of our workshop to give maybe to more attention to, to climate change uh, regarding to the concrete task of the, of the country, of the region. Um, I do not know if my, my, my question is, is clear for you. Yeah. No. <laughs> so could we, no, could well, we go? I, I've, I've yeah. got your question right. And um, so let me, let me uh, answer that. Uh, my purpose was not to undermine the role the VNS is violent non state actors play. At time, crime is very, very important. And for that matter, states, as a matter of fact, if you see the whole issue about uh, low intensity conflict operations in terms of maritime crime, in terms of piracy, drugs, guns, and they've been, as a matter of fact, post 9-11, we found that they had reached a certain level, terrorism, piracy, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And Bay of Bengal has had its fair share. We've had a share in terms of Al-Qaeda, Jamai, Islamia present. We've already had in terms of the Friate movement. We've already had a major, uh, well, let's say, asymmetry I to call the LTT in Sri Lanka. I think they can be credited for having been the real, you know, the front runners in terms of maritime terrorism. Because I, and having operated in Sri Lanka myself for that matter during the operations, we realized that they were very important force. So these issues are very critical. They've not gone, I've not undermined them. As a matter of fact, they are there. This is not to suggest they are not important. For that matter, tomorrow we have a transit of, of a vessel carrying WMT through the Bay of Bengal and it creates a problem over there. We are going to be worried about it. So as of now, the focus was to look at biodiversity and maritime security, trying to link that up. And I find that each one has its own role to play. Not the the, the so-called uh, low level in terms of, let's say, violent non-state actors that are equally going to be problematic for us. It's going to impact the entire blue economy. So it's port security, sea lines of communication, a whole lot of issues will be coming. IUU fishing is going to impact on the entire blue economy. To that extent, every vertical or any subset within the blue economy, broader blue economy, has some role to play. Any breach, or for that many, any guard which is down as for the blue economy, because such a wide definition for blue economy is going to be problematic for the region. So each one has a role to play. And given that, I will also was conscious of the fact that my two panelists are going to talk about these issues. So I said, I let them allow to speak about it. It is just that I was carrying forward their threats and challenges and brought in another set of threats and challenges. That is in terms of, you know, uh, uh, Jay talked about variety of the non uh, those issues, non state security. Uh, Admiral talked about, you know, the Quad and the Indo-Pacific. There are going to be symptoms, as I said, reverberations of what's going on in Western Pacific. So here is a holistic view. If you see, all three of us have brought in some because we are not. To say, I, I'm not to suggest that they are not important. They are extremely important. They have a role to play. As a matter of fact, it will be easy for if we bring them and holistically and look them in, in, in a way that they they bring in. We they turn the conscious of the policymakers to say these are extremely important for this region. Thank you, thank you, Vijay. I, I, yeah, of course, we, we all do agree on the on the need to to adopt. Um, I will say, yeah, I will repeat an holistic uh, holistic approach when it came to uh, the maritime concern of the all uh, of the whole region. Yes, clearly. Uh, Amiral Hassan, do you want to to add something to to complement? Your, your, your mic, your mic, Admiral. Yeah, what, I, uh, what I'll try to uh, add here is, you see, as um, maritime security operators or people in uniform, we always prepare ourselves for war, uh, keeping in mind that war has not gone away. 
But having said that, if you would see in the last uh, three decades or so, the geoeconomics, I would say, I would argue that has taken over uh, priorities over geopolitics. And now countries are more and more concerned uh, about their own economic well-being. And that drives them to the cooperative engagements and uh, collaborative frameworks. The question, if we ask whether uh, the um, uh, non-traditional threats are uh, more prominent or the issues of um, climate change impacts. Actually, the non-traditional threats are there and they will remain. Only thing we have to do now is add the additional template of the climate change impacts into the table. And then you get a broader picture of uh, how the policy priorities have to be uh, designed and defined. If I could make some sense. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Uh, I'm coming now to you, Jay, to, to have your view on that, because when you introduce your point, you, you mention, uh, in fact, uh, illicit maritime trade, because I, I took my notes, you know, and uh, maritime migration also. Uh, so this is why uh, I, I raise this point about the hierarchy of uh, maritime concern for, for the state to, to be sure that we, we, we really understand, uh, because if you want to answer and to fit in a good and go in a good direction, we need to have a clear view of the, of the need of the region. And particularly when it came to increasing maritime domain awareness. So what is your view, Jay, about that? Yeah, I, I, I would say that uh, there's not a ton I can add uh, to, the, to the answers already provided by the other panelists, but um, I would just kind of echo um, some of the points I think that they raised in that um, I don't think that it's a, an either or um, type of proposition uh, as to, you know, <clears throat> what's, uh, what's the highest priority as far as violent non-state actors versus these, these climate change issues. Um, I think the, the specific challenges um, posed by violent non-state actors or, or um, non-traditional security threats in um, individual states in the region vary extremely significantly. Um, and, and so those need to be tailored country by country and, and sub, sub-nationally. Um, <clears throat> But that climate change <clears throat> is really kind of in a different box in, in some ways in that it impacts on all of these things. Um, it impact, as we, we've heard already, you know, it impacts on the blue economy, it, it impacts on uh, coastal welfare, on all of these different issues. Um, and, and so it's, it's something that can't be addressed in isolation. Uh, we need to look at how it impacts all of these different um, non-traditional maritime security issues, um, and, and try and you know understand the the relationships between those things in order to to mitigate the the kind of climate security uh, concerns in the maritime domain. So uh, I don't know if that was as coherent as I would like, but uh, largely just to echo the the points that the other panelists already made. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to to all of you for bringing your, your, your thought uh, in, a, in a so clear, clear way. Uh, I'm, I'm just going to, to check the question and answer uh, question uh, box and maybe to, to see in the audience if uh, anybody want to, um, to say something. Nicola, if you, if you want to, to take. Take the floor. Yes, thank, thank you, Marianne. My name is Nicolas Rego from the Institute for Strategic Research, IRSEM. And I have a question for Admiral Naz uh, Nazmul Hassan in particular. Admiral, you've mentioned Hagam uh, in your presentation, and I'd like to, you to give your appreciation for this collaborative platform uh, between Coast Guard agencies. Uh, one of its field of activities is marine protection besides search and rescue, combating illicit activities at sea, and capacity building, how do you view HAGAM potential for developing efficient regional cooperation in marine protection activities, but also combating illicit activities at sea? And what is HAGAM's strengths and weaknesses for the time being? And also, I'd like to know 
how does HAGAM takes into account climate change security consequences? Right, so thank you very much for your question. Um, the question has um, quite a few dimensions. I will um, try to address um, all the dimensions that you brought in in the question, if I can. Uh, first of all, uh, the last uh, meeting of the head of Asian Coast Guard uh, agencies um, was of uh, 22 countries. So the, if you ask about the strength of the uh, multilateral organization itself, I think it itself it speaks where there are 22 uh, head of um, Coast Guard sitting together, those who are responsible for uh, maritime protection in their own waters, then it speaks of a uh, large platform. The uh, weakness, if I may say, uh, is the institutional framework. I understand by uh, turn the chair is changed and each country is made responsible. But what, in my opinion, is more important is to have a physical infrastructure, a framework from where you know the day-to-day decision-making, day-to-day uh, works of coordination and cooperation and sharing of, sharing of information can take place. So this, in my humble opinion, is one weakness, if I may call it a weakness. The uh, meeting, I would not, um, I have not really seen the climate change as one of the uh, agenda of discussion uh, in this particular forum as yet. But having said that, um, as we see that the uh, climate change impact has cross-cutting effects in all the other areas of security concerns. So indirectly, yes, they are also in some way dealing with the climate change impacts, the marine pollution, uh, and the tradi other traditional um, uh, issues of concerns like the uh, trafficking of narcotics, the human trafficking and, and the like. So uh, there are uh, huge potentials, but um, the organization I would say has still a long way to go. The important thing, the last remark is, you know, the I, I always feel proud to be in uniform because while we put on uniform, it's much easier to speak uh, the language of my, um, my colleague in the other country. Unlike uh, in the political arena or uh, to some extent in the other uh, arenas of cooperation, between the military, the co field cooperation is always uh, easier and more effective, I would claim. Thank you. Thank you, Admiral. Um, I have a question for, for, for all of you. Um, it was a question um, about global multilateral organization and the role of the IMO, the International Maritime Organization, in the region, because we, we all know that in the fight against piracy in the Indian Ocean, uh, the, of the coast of, um, of the coast of the Horn of Africa, IMO has really a leading role. And so the question is wondering about the role of IMO uh, in the Bay of Bengal. Uh, and I have a, a specific addition, uh, there's a similar regional uh, mentality of limiting external actor involvement, minimal, also apply to issue in the region. So what is the role of the IMO? And is there uh, a mentality in the region to limit the influence of the action or the involvement of external, uh, external actor? What do you think? Could we, could we uh, reverse and go through uh, Jay, uh, uh, Vijay, and, and Admiral uh, for, for, the, for the answer, <laughs> just to change? Uh, sure. Um, I apologize. I, 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 I can't speak specifically to the, um, to the activities of the, yeah. of, of the IMO, specifically in the Bay of Bengal. I would say if it's in regards to... Uh, the IMO's activities in counter piracy off the Horn of Africa, there's not uh, anything near that level of that type of activity um, in, in the Bay of Bengal to address. Um, but, uh, you know, to, to speak more broadly, um, I think that there is certainly a role for external actors to play in capacity building, be that 
um, you know, training, um, you know, uh, resource provision, asset provision, things like that, investment in, in the blue economy. These are many of these industries are, are resource intensive or are, are capital intensive and investment would be um, would be extremely valuable. Um, but I think the, the overarching point that needs to be um, made is that those that interaction needs to be shaped by the regional states themselves um, and not serve the interests of the external actors within the region. Um, I think too often um, external actors come in um, in the, you know, the spirit of capacity building, um, but maybe dictate the terms of that uh, what what they think should fit should be the best solution in, in a given situation, rather than really listening to the um, the needs of of the regional actors themselves, and and perhaps in that spirit, I'll I'll defer speaking any further as we have actual representatives from the region here. Thank you, thank you, Jay. Uh, sorry, uh, Vijay, would you like to? Uh, yeah. to add a comment to that. Um, thank you. Uh, I, I will respond to that. But uh, let me just give a small little brief comment on the previous one, the role of uh, the Coast Guards. Uh, let me give you an example of the Indian Coast Guard uh, on the East Coast in the state of Orissa. The Coast Guard has been monitoring the movement of turtles. These are called the Oliver Ridley turtles. They carry out protection patrol for about two months, particularly for this species. So their involvement in terms of, let's say, biodiversity, ecology, it, it comes in bits and pieces. Of course, their primary task is to look at marine pollution, you know, counter piracy, counter, you know, uh, illegal trafficking, et cetera, et cetera. And more recently, in terms of the fires on board two merchant vessels on the east coast of uh, Sri Lanka and the west coast of Sri Lanka. I think they've been uh, playing, uh, doing a great job. But coming back to this particular question, IMO is everywhere. I mean, most states are bound by, we are all signatory to the, we are all party to the UN and all its conventions. IMO is, I would call it a Bible of sorts. We abide by it. It's a very important uh, institution, gives us the direction. And we, we look at lots of its regimes, whether, you know, maritime security uh, orders which come out. And if you, if you want to be part of the international commerce, into the global economy, I think IMO is a Bible to go by because it gives us direction. Right. Of course, you may have differences in terms of how they go about their business, but then everybody, we have representatives at the IMO. So it, it, it's a very highly democratized uh, uh, institution. So there's a lot of respect amongst the mariners community uh, as far as IMO is concerned. About the extra regional powers, again, I, I, I would, uh, let, let, let me be a little more blunt. As long as, yes, please. <laughs> as long as, I won't call them external because today it's a globalized world. Oceans are everywhere. We just can't say it is my water, other than you know my territorial sea and thereafter my EZ. What we need is so long their intentions are non-intrusive. They are sensitive to local sensitive. They are they are conscious of the local sensitivity. They're always welcome. We already have, as a matter of fact, uh, we have uh, uh, at least a couple of countries coming from Europe who are helping certain countries in the Bay of Bengal in their marine domain awareness in terms of underwater surveys, setting up, uh, setting up even uh, energy pipelines, energy infrastructure. So there are all there, but there are always fears how intrusive they were. It's always welcome so long it is non-intrusive and doesn't hurt the sentiments of the people in those many terms, so long they don't attract with them political, strategic, diplomatic uh, sensitivity. Thank you, Vijay. And Mihal, I'm, I'm coming to you. Do, do you have some, some elements, uh, some perspective to, to, to add regarding the uh, external actor and welcoming or not external actor uh, initiative in the, in the region? What is your view about that? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, I would fully agree with Mr. Sakuza in saying that uh, oceans are actually great binders. I saw one uh, Norwegian proverb uh, which says that um, the land divides while the sea unites. So sea in my opinion or the ocean in my opinion is a 
um, uh, uniting domain. So there is, um, uh, I, I would not see any uh, inhibition from any literal state to have um, external, uh, the countries from the uh, extra regional countries to have and uh, have some suggestions, some technical expertise, some uh, assistance for that matter. If I can speak for Bangladesh, uh, Japan had uh, always been a great um, a collaborator and partner in the uh, maritime uh, area and uh, in various sectors in the maritime field for Bangladesh. Now, France, for that matter, uh, you would know, uh, have worked in the past in the in developing the hydrography uh, department of Bangladesh Navy, uh, which is the pioneer department in hydrography uh, back in 1995 and 2001. And um, uh, the, as um, the other two speakers have also mentioned, International Maritime Organization is a regulatory body and they set the guidelines and standards. So um, there is, um, I would not see any reason why either this organization or any of the external uh, players uh, would be seen as a, um, uh, as a, uh, you know, the adversary, rather they should be seen more as a collaborator and a, a helper in uh, capacity building, uh, both in maritime domain awareness, in climate uh, um, change, um, uh, the challenges mitigation and so on. So I, I always see positives into it. Thank you. Thank you, Anirul. Thank you um, to all of you for, for answering to this, to this question, which uh, was uh, elaborated in, uh, in a very global way, but if I, um, I am allowed to be blunt too, I guess that there is something to, to, to do with the great power rivalries and maybe the BRI uh, uh, offer and uh, the infrastructure quality that is developed be between India and Japan. And maybe the fact that uh, through the development of uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, um, EU uh, itself is reinvesting in capacity building in very concrete initiative uh, in the region. And so this gives the impression of, uh, you know, a, a, very, a very wanted region uh, with a great power uh, trying to, to attract or to enlarge the political influence uh, by offering uh, some, some initiative. And so, uh, well, we, we can see it, of course, in a cooperative way, uh, taking uh, what is what is good through this uh, offer. Uh, but there are some 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 political readings regarding or uh, in the fact that maybe the region try to uh, to edge uh, between this uh, this big power and trying not to be entrapped. Uh, in this uh, in this competition, so it could be the um, I will say the, the, the more negative way uh, to uh, you see to to project and to see to scrutinize uh, this um, I will say so um, so many um, initiative uh, in um, in direction of the of the region. But I will stop with uh, I will stop with that. Um, well, I, I do not know if we have any more question from the from the room I just check to be sure um, my uh, question box I, I just see a, a comment uh, maybe I can just mention this this comment for for the awareness of, of everybody so extensive data for marine sir is essential for blue economy development maritime scientific research and coordinated maritime security and HADR. Trans Pacific Bangladesh Navy Hydrography Department, as, as you already mentioned, uh, Anirul, uh, and, uh, and in two projects to develop the to automatic hydrography, sorry. Hydrospatial data serve as the base of the mari marine spatial data infrastructure I hope that France government will uh, again help Bangladesh to develop NSDI. So, well, I hope that uh, the French government will uh, will hear the message um, and maybe as they could uh, could help <laughs> in that. So, thank you very much. I, I see that we are uh, just reaching the, the the end of 
of uh, uh, the slot that was uh, allocated for the for the discussion, which has been a very fruitful uh, discussion. Thanks for the passion you put, uh, the passion you put uh, in your presentation uh, and uh, in the quality of the, your answer. Uh, thank you, thank you again. It was really a, a very interesting exchange. Uh, if I can briefly uh, just uh, uh, just mention the, the main takeaway of this of this exchange, um, in in my understanding, uh, first of all, uh, the the primacy, the centrality of the blue economy, uh, obviously, uh, because the blue economy is really at the at the intersection of uh, many, many maritime concerns, that is to say climate change, of course, pollution, EU fishing, and we can see that there are a lot of um, regional cooperation uh, when it came to the blue economy in the conceptualization of the, uh, of the, of the notion, what is blue economy, uh, in the putting together um, implementing workshop, and uh, you, you mentioned the role of IORA, BIMSTEC, but also IONS, which can be a way of putting in action and giving a more concrete uh, substance to the blue economy. When you mention uh, capacity building or training exercise, and Bangladesh, when it took the lead in establishing a HDR exercise, for example, this is a, a very concrete answer, and maybe we can dig uh, into this cooperative framework for the Navy of the region to, to develop HRDR and other initiative in line with the protection uh, or preservation or reaction um, uh, toward impact of climate change. Uh, I took also from our exchange the importance of maritime domain awareness. Obviously, it was mentioned by quasi all uh, of the panelists, maybe in a different way, but the, the, the major acceptance of MDA is knowing what happened at sea, but also having the tool to be able to control your maritime domain, that is to say uh, knowledge, scientific knowledge, uh, but that is to say uh, um, capacity of policing, so having uh, maritime police, having Coast Guard, having uh, some uh, technical tools. Uh, we heard about radar, uh, satellite imagery, uh, and again, capacity building. And uh, if um, I can add uh, something more personal, um, uh, that's a need for complementarity because I had the impression that we had a very global framework and picture with a lot of actors, uh, institutional, non-institutional non actors, many tools, many initiatives, meaning uh, a lot of resources, uh, financial, human, institutional, uh, in the blue economy, in climate change. And in fact, maybe uh, at this stage, there is a need to uh, uh, assess more clearly the complementarity of this uh, different uh, initiative, uh, because if we want to, to come in the region and to offer uh, support, whatever we, we think about, uh, maybe in contributing to capacity building in the field of knowledge, that could be another workshop, to better know uh, about each other. And I understand this is the first step. Uh, or if we want to offer some more technical uh, tools, we need to better understand uh, and uh, to think about this complementarity, not being a newcomer uh, coming with a redundant vision uh, in, in, in inefficiency at the end of the day vision. So I stop there. And uh, I let the floor uh, to, to, to Mr. Uh, Geneva, who is going to conclude. But maybe, Julia, you want to add something regarding your own panel. Sorry. And it will be very brief because I think you really grasp the, 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 the core of the discussion. Um, the maritime domain awareness being uh, for fish stock, um, more about data collection and understanding and having 
um, campaign, uh, scientific campaign. I would just like to add on the fact that you talked about complementary um, and uh, understanding who can do what and where. And the fact that um, we mentioned uh, natural sciences during the first panel. And I think what we understand is also that we will need more social sciences to understand how communities and coastal population um, live with a climate change impact and apprehend climate change impact. I think that's, uh, that's something we could, uh, we could uh, remember for, for the next step as well. Um, and before giving the floor to, to uh, Mr. Rémy Ganevet, I would just like to um, emphasize the fact that during all the presentation, we understood that if climate change is an existential threat for some of the population of uh, the Bay of Bengal, it's only uh, adding up to uh, concrete and current problems and issues that needs to be tackled at the same time. So there is a lot to do, I would say, um, whether it be for um, marine biodiversity as well as for uh, human coastal populations. So I will now give uh, the floor for the closing remarks to Mr. Rémy Genevet, the Executive Director and Head of Asia Department at IFD. Thank you very much, Julia. Uh, esteemed participants and dear colleagues, I'm very honored to conclude this uh, web conference on the impacts of climate change on biodiversity and maritime security in the Bay of Bengal. Ever since it, especially since it was co-organized with the Directorate General of uh, International Relations and Strategy of the French Ministry of the Armed Forces. This is an illustration of the French global approach between development practitioners, the diplomatic corps and the military, which is being implemented in the Sahel region, as some of you may know, but also in other contexts, namely in research and knowledge production. This approach refers to what we call the three D, the three Ds being defense, diplomacy, and development, development practitioners, but can also bring different players uh, around the table using academic research and knowledge to support efficient development solutions. This is also the, fir the first French event stamped with the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative IPOI label. As a reminder, the IPOI was launched in uh, uh, 2019 by Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. Among the seven key pillars of this program, five have been tackled during this seminar, trade connectivity, maritime transport, maritime security, maritime ecology, and maritime resources. France officially joined the uh, initiative during French Foreign Minister Jean-Yves Le Drian's visit to India in April this year. France agreed to take the lead for the marine resources pillar, which includes sustainable management of fish stocks, preservation of species, fighting against illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing. AFD uh, is a key contributor to this topic as part of our Indo-Pacific strategy. The think tank IRIS and uh, Julia Tass in particular must be praised for the wonderful organization and moderation of uh, this seminar. And uh, I also extend my, my thanks to all the, the moderators, and of course, including uh, Marianne, who did a, a wonderful job in session two, which, which was the only one I could attend myself. But I will uh, look at the, uh, at the recording that has been made of this seminar. So please accept my sincere thanks for this achievement which we hope will en enable French players to further contribute to the development of the blue economy in South Asia. So what is AFD's role in, in this French uh, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy? It's time for a little, a little advertisement for AFD. Uh, AFD plays an important role in implementing a uh, French Indo-Pacific strategy. France's vision of Indo-Pacific is to make this space more inclusive while aiming at reaching three main objectives. First off, the security of all the inhabitants of the region. Second, the transnational solidarity by promoting global public goods as a number uh, uh, of uh, the speakers have mentioned. And uh, third, strengthen French and European influence and attractiveness. 
AFD will contribute to these goals in a multiple in multiple ways. Of course, AFD's AFD has an underlying mission of contributing to French influence in the region and upholding French interest by widening and strengthening its strategic partnerships. <clears throat> but most specifically, uh, AFD extends official development assistance, ODA, and rolls out its exp expertise and technical assistance to promote global public goods and support economic, demographic, territorial, energy, and technological transitions. This mission is in line with our group's strategic orientation plan, uh, which uh, you can find and read on our website, whereby AFD commits to be 100% aligned with the Paris Agreement, and as we say, 100% social link. Hence, AFD, AFD strives to promote the preservation of ecosystems and resources and supports the fight against marine pollutions while taking into account the needs for local populations. Our specific role, specific role in the Indo-Pacific is closely related, closely related to its maritime strategy. In that area, AFD's efforts focus on improving the governance of marine and coastal areas and resources, on promoting competitive, sustainable and inclusive maritime economic sectors, on preserving marine and coastal ecosystems and managing anthropogenic pressure. As Gilles Kletz certainly said earlier, I wasn't there, but I know him, AFD already committed over 5 billion euros to uh, maritime projects between uh, 2008 and 2019, out of which 700 million euros in 2019 alone. In both South Asia and Southeast Asia regional strategies, one of the stated priorities is to promote a, a sustainable use of territories and to preserve natural resources with a view to climate change adaptation. Blue economy, <coughs> sorry, blue economy is identified as a promising area for intervention for AFD in those two regions. Indeed, this topic enables to tackle both environmental and social aspects that are common to different countries in the region that this was particularly underlined in, in, in uh, Mr. Vijay Sekuja's presentation. For example, for example, out of AFD's uh, 2019 maritime commitments, 30%, 37% of the dedicated amount contribute to biodiversity conservation, 66% general generate climate co-benefits, and 30% of projects contribute to gender equality. Of course, those percentages do not add up as uh, projects have several virtues, of course. This is particularly important as access to, to productive resources is particularly unequal between men and women in ocean-related sectors. AFD-funded projects are designed with this imbalance in mind and aim to promote or improve the status of women and reduce inequalities. <coughs> Those figures also show that AFD promotes nature-based solutions and green infrastructure. AFD projects bring together climate and biodiversity issues in response to the needs of societies and ecosystems. In line with the Indo-Pacific strategy, we intend to support intra-regional multi-country projects which foster the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods, job creations and job creations while preserving the health of the maritime ecosystem. In order to translate those strategic commitments into operational substance, AFD dedicates significant resources to a better understanding of, of those uh, challenges. <coughs> there are already a couple of projects that support the establishments of resilient and productive maritime and coastal areas in the region. In Indonesia, one project targets the improvement of weather forecasts and early warning systems for, for stakeholders in the, in the marine economy, and also contributes to the knowledge foundation 
on climate. Another one focuses on maritime logistics and port sector. Among other projects we have in the pipeline are, for instance, ports rehabilitations in, in Sri Lanka and support to the fishing and aquaculture sector in India in partnership with the World Bank. <coughs> I will also add that AFD will gladly uh, consider working on the preservation or restoration of the mangrove forests as we do in Southeast Asia. And this is uh, to echo uh, what uh, Mr. Sekuja mentioned also in his own presentation. But we need more research to back up our activities and make sure that all projects ensure biodiversity protection and sustain livelihoods for local population. This is what this seminar is all about, implementing a research program focusing on meaning, meaningful problematics around the exploitation of the seas and oceans of the region. I'm almost finished. Uh, it, I would also uh, give you a few illustration of what I mentioned before, that is to say the 3D approach. In its uh, strategic orientation plan, AFD commits to promoting this, this 3D approach associating defense, diplomacy and development. Uh, the, the idea behind this uh, holistic governmental approach is that development practitioners, diplomatic corps and the military must discuss in order to help bring about peace more efficiently and not to have development lagging too much behind what the military may have helped to achieve and what the diplomacy is trying to promote. This is why this uh, conference co-organized with uh, DGRIS is of particular importance. Blue economy is a good example of an issue where both the military and the, the development practitioners can bring together their expertise and help making the Indo-Pacific area a safer and more inclusive space. <coughs> While AFD can promote the preservation of marine biodiversity and the sustainable management of fishing resources, this approach will not, would not be complete without the means that enable to enforce those concepts, maritime, maritime security and surveillance. This also shows that AFD is aware that many players have to be brought together to overcome the challenges arising from climate change and anthropic pressure on resources. AFD's medium term aspiration is to initiate public policy dialogues. And uh, we are very active in a number of public policy dialogues throughout this region. Academic researchers, economic stakeholders, as well as government officials have to be consulted to ensure that, to ensure the sustainability of the maritime space. And AFD is driven to making those discussions take place since these policy dialogues will make our project happen for the benefit of the riparian populations and also for the benefit of the whole planet, or so we hope. Thank you for listening to me. This was my last word and this is the, also the end of my voice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so before closing the session, I would just like to, to thank, of course, all the panelists for joining, um, General Colcombe and uh, Mr. Révi, Rémi Genevé for opening and closing the webinar. Um, those different presentations and, and um, words have really brought food for thought, I think, uh, for the month to come. So we will circulate uh, presentations and, and uh, and a resume of uh, a, sum a summary of what has been said. And I would also like to thank the AFD and the, the GRS team that have really, really been key in, uh, in organizing this webinar um, in the past weeks. So thank you very much to, to, to you for, for helping us in, uh, in that, I would say, really busy uh, time for all of us. And so thank you for watching us wherever you are. Please keep in touch with us. Also, please feel free to, to write to me or to the IRIS team and we will 
uh, transfer your forward your your email to the to the to the speakers if uh, if needed. And well, I hope that I can say that we will see you soon for another webinar or another research program on that topic. Thank you very much and have a good day. Bye.